Good morning. Everyone followed the court's admonition last night? Get a good night's rest? Good. Stayed away from any media coverage? Good. I have a couple instructions I'd like to share with you before we actually begin with opening statements and the trial itself. The first instruction has to do with taking of notes. You have the opportunity to take notes during the course of this trial, and you've been given materials to do so. The first thing I want to share with you is there's no requirement you take notes. This isn't class. So if you wish to take a note and you think that will be helpful to you, please do. If you don't feel it will be particularly helpful and you want to just use your recall and memory of the facts, that's equally fine. We're not going to be watching whether you're taking notes or not. So it is a tool that you may utilize if you wish. I do emphasize, again, it is your recall and memory of the facts as you find them to be that is the most important feature of your service as a juror. What I mean by that is when you go into the jury room, if someone says, well, this is a fact because I wrote it down, doesn't necessarily mean you should say, well, if my recollection is differently, I should just give that up. That's what the discussion back and forth and deliberations is all about. So it's your memory and recall that is the most important service you have. And of course, notes may assist you with that uh, as you choose to take those notes. As always, keep your notes confidential. Uh, keep them to yourself. Uh, when we take a break, just fold them up, put them on your chair. When we leave in the evening, you will uh, uh, just leave them in the chair and we will keep them secure overnight and then provide them to you again in the morning. Uh, I will uh, also indicate to you that uh, when you retire to deliberate, you'll be able to take the notes with you. Uh, utilize them as you wish during your deliberations, and then when the trial is over, we will take the notes back and shred them. They will not be made a record in this case, so if doodling helps you focus, feel free to do that as well in your notes. It's up to you. So, uh, again, I wanted to indicate you have the right to do so, but give you a few instructions about the taking of those notes. Now, I also indicated to you that you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of witnesses during the course of the trial, and what we will do is this procedure. Any one of you can ask a question. I also want to emphasize it's not required that you ask a question. What we will do is when the witness has concluded their testimony by counsel, I will then ask the jury if you have any questions. And if you have a question, you'll write it down on a piece of paper. And I'll give you some time if you need to do so to formulate that. Uh, one of our staff members will stop over and pick up your questions. Now, the question should be pointed to the witness's testimony only. In other words, the topic they were on and the facts that they presented to you, that would be the nature of any questions you might have. Uh, if you've got questions about other aspects of the case, you have to wait until that witness testifies regarding that. We will take your questions and I will review them and counsel will review them together. There are rules of evidence. As you know, I rule on objections. And, and so because you're not lawyers, you may ask a question that I can't ask the witness. Uh, or there may be a question that I rephrase the way that you pose the question. Uh, or I may just ask the question as you presented it to that witness to answer it on your behalf. So do not uh, take anything from the fact that perhaps a question is not asked that you provided. Uh, as I say, there are certain rules that I have to address dealing with the questions posed to that witness. Again, I emphasize the question should be regarding solely the testimony of that witness. If there's something they said you wanted to be more clarified or or a question regarding their testimony you wanted to flesh out a little bit more, you certainly are entitled to ask those types of questions, but only to that particular witness. Uh, we will keep uh, uh, the questions, and uh, again, I emphasize you're not required to ask questions. If just one of you wants to ask a question out of the entire panel, that's fine. If none of you have any questions, that's equally fine. So uh, it's entirely an option, again, like taking notes, available to you that might assist you in uh, developing and understanding the testimony and evidence as it is presented to you. All right, with that, we're going to begin our case. As you know, uh, the first portion of the case are opening statements of counsel. Uh, because the state has the burden of proof, the state can speak to you first, and then the defense will have an opportunity to address you as well. Opening statements are designed to give you a sense or a roadmap of what this case is about from the perspective of both parties. Uh, and they will share that information with you. And I think it's helpful to give you a, a kind of a context or a beginning to what this case is about. I do caution you that opening statements in and of themselves are not evidence. In fact, rarely anything a lawyer says is actually evidence. They ask questions of witnesses 
and the answers of the witnesses are evidence, but not the questions of the lawyer, unless the witness agrees with the question posed by that lawyer. Nonetheless, uh, opening statements are helpful to give you some perspective as to where we're going, but in and of themselves, they are not evidence. When the first witness takes a stand, that's when we begin the presentation of evidence in this case. Please give your attention to the representative of the state. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as the judge just stated to you, opening statements is our chance to give you a roadmap. I know that this courtroom's a little wonky right now, so I'll probably wander back and forth, so please uh, don't mind me over here. Um, now, I'll be honest with you, when I first uh, get a new book, um, one of the first things I do is actually read the last few chapters of the book. Uh, it gives me an idea of where things are gonna go. Uh, the ending is usually the most important part usually the most exciting part. Um, but what I've learned over the years is that that's a pretty bad practice to have because without an understanding of the characters, of the plot, of what's happening beforehand, the ending really can be far different than what you're reading in black and white and what you see in front of you. Now, what you'll see in this case, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is really no different than some of those books. The ending that you may just see if you were presented that today uh, is not what it seems. And what you'll hear during the testimony, during the evidence in this case, is that there's a lot of things you need to be aware of about what happened before Emily Noble went missing. What was happening and what people were doing while Emily Noble was missing and what happened afterwards. Those details are extremely important in this case. And we ask you to focus on those details as you hear the evidence. What we expect you to hear during the presentation of the next two weeks, when you hear the evidence, the testimony, is that you'll see the ending in this case. You'll see that this is a very real case. This isn't a book. This is very real. And it'll be clear to you what happened to Emily Noble. Emily Noble was born on May 24th of 1968. You'll hear from friends, family, people that knew her, will describe you to her, that she was outdoorsy, that she liked to forage for plants and herbs in various uh, forested areas, uh, the exact place that you went yesterday during your jury view, uh, specifically, and I'll point that to you here in a second. You'll hear that she was outgoing and never met a stranger. You also hear that she was brave, and you'll hear ample testimony about Emily Noble's life. Now, you'll hear early on uh, from some of the people most closely related that knew Emily the best. Uh, you'll hear from uh, her sister that during this time period, uh, where the, most of the facts and circumstances of this case will be, uh, which is uh, May 24th, May 25th and May 26th, that that was a special time period for both Emily and her sister. You'll find out through the testimony, and we expect you'll hear that today, that Emily and her sister were born two days apart, the 24th and the 26th. And so the 25th was the one date and time that they were the same age. And that was a special time for them and something that they seemingly celebrated almost every year. What you'll hear during the testimony in this case is, again, the experiences everyone had with Emily. And the one thing that I think will be prevalent is that she has undergone, uh, undergone a large amount of tragedy in her life. And as you'll hear testimony, we expect you'll hear testimony that during all these trials and tribulations that Emily went through, she was brave, she persevered, and fought through. Now. We expect during the testimony that you'll hear evidence that Emily was previously married. Uh, the individual's name is Mark. Uh, you'll hear that at uh, one point while they were married, uh, Mark died uh, in 2011 uh, and that he committed suicide. 
What you'll hear is that, again, that happened in 2011. And we expect you'll hear testimony about how Emily, Emily dealt with that in her personal life, her friends and family that were around her at that time, and how she persevered through a very trying time in her life. We also expect that you'll hear testimony that both of Emily's parents died within a year of each other, in 2015 and 2016. And that, again, Emily, we expect you'll hear testimony, her reactions to that, what she did, what she did to work through those, those issues, what she did to work through that stress. And we expect you'll hear testimony from those individuals over the next two weeks. During that same time frame, Emily met the defendant, Matthew Moore. When Emily met Mr. Moore, uh, he also had a son that he brought to that marriage, and that son's name is Joey. We expect you to hear testimony a little bit about Joey over the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> what you'll hear is that during their marriage, uh, up until uh, 2018, that leading, well, I should say, leading up to their marriage, that there was a relationship between Mr. Moore and Mr. Noble, or Miss Noble and Mr. Moore, that they met each other, that they started a relationship. At that time, the defendant was living in Las Vegas, uh, eventually came to Westerville, and uh, that's where they lived in their uh, condo at Abbey Cross. From that time period on, the two of them, as well as Joey, lived at that location, the location that you saw yesterday during your jury view. As I mentioned, you'll hear a little bit of testimony about uh, their relationship during that time period, uh, friends as well as family members that were around during that. Once the defendant was around, we expect you'll hear testimony from the witnesses over the next couple of weeks that some of those relationships that Emily had, long-standing relationships with friends, uh, became strained, that they became less frequent. The uh, more routine or even yearly get-togethers ceased happening, and that those relationships uh, ceased to exist other than conversations occurring on the phone, text messages, but those yearly meetings and get-togethers that were so prevalent and important to many people uh, became less frequent. We expect you'll hear that in 2019, uh, tragedy struck Emily Noble once more. And that was when uh, the son of the defendant, uh, Joey, who was living there, that Emily uh, took a passion to um, committed suicide as well. Now, what's important to note, and I expect the testimony that you'll hear over the next two weeks will demonstrate to you, is that Emily was proactive when these issues occurred in her life. She sought therapy. She talked to others. During this time period, after Joey committed suicide in 2019, uh, we expect that you'll hear testimony that she took time off of work uh, to be at home with the defendant, to work through what had just happened in their life, to seek therapy. And that towards the end of 2019, after doing those things, after being proactive, she continued to persevere and went back to work. Now, we also expect you to hear testimony that leading up to that, and then going now into 2020, that uh, Emily was making real changes in her life. She was changing her lifestyle, her diet, trying to be more physically fit, those types of things that she's been working through over the course of the years, um, and that she was making serious changes in her life and seemingly was in a good place uh, based on individuals that were around her, speaking with her, and talking with her. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's information we expect you to hear over the next two weeks, and I think that that is of paramount importance to understand the background 
and what is occurring prior to the disappearance of Emily Noble. And we expect that you'll hear ample testimony over that, uh, of that over the next two weeks. But ladies and gentlemen, you'll also hear testimony about uh, May 24th, 2020, May 25th of 2020. And that is the last time Emily Noble was found alive. <clears throat> we expect you'll hear testimony that on the 24th, which of course was her birthday, that she and the defendant went to a water string or a water spring in uh, Bucktail, Ohio, which is about an hour, hour and a half southeast of uh, Columbus. That they had plans that day. Uh, eventually went back to their home in Westerville in the uh, what's known as the Uptown Westerville area, uh, which is the little downtown area where there are many stores, restaurants, places you could walk back and forth, walk into. You'll hear that the two of them uh, went to a couple of different establishments, uh, Old Bag of Nails, Coble, uh, Jimmy V's. Again, these are restaurants that are located in uptown Westerville. And that roughly around the time period of uh, 7 p.m., a little bit before, they were back at their home on Abbey Cross in Westerville, the place that you visited yesterday. Uh, you'll see throughout this uh, trial, there were a few pictures taken from that day, pictures of Ms. Noble, with the defendant. And one thing that you'll note is that these are regular pictures, selfies. There's no injuries, no injuries to the neck, face area, and that becomes important when we're looking at the timeline of events. And again, you'll hear testimony about this as we go through this case over the next two weeks. The next day, on May 25th of 2020, we expect you'll see evidence that it wasn't until 5.47 p.m. that the defendant made a phone call to one of Emily's friends to say she was missing. It wasn't then until 5.54 p.m. that the Westerville Police Department was first notified and Ms. Noble had seemingly disappeared and vanished out of sight. What we'll ask you to do is focus on the timeline of events, and you'll hear testimony over the next two weeks. You'll hear and see a body camera from one of the officers today that originally came out to the scene and spoke to Mr. Moore. Expect that during that testimony you hear evidence that Mr. Moore was awake, uh, according to his words, as early as 10 a.m. Again, uh, as early as 10 a.m., uh, the phone call made with the friend was at 5.47 p.m. We expect that you'll hear his story initially, that the two of them had came back to their house, slept together in the bedroom. He woke up at some point at 1.30 in the morning, uh, went and slept in another room, and then when he woke up, she was gone. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see pictures of the house. You'll hear the statements made by Mr. Moore at the time, and what you'll find out during the testimony is that not only had Emily apparently disappeared, according to to the defendant's own statement, but that was done without a note. You'll find out that she didn't tell anyone she was leaving. Her phone was left behind. Her ID was left behind. Her wallet was still at the house. Her car was still at the house. And that she seemingly disappeared after making the bed that morning. You also hear testimony that Leading up to that weekend, Ms. Noble made a dentist appointment for the following week. And that that was not canceled. We also expect her to hear testimony that nothing had changed with her employment and seemingly everything was normal. 
What you'll hear during, this te during the testimony, uh, during the body cam, as well as testimony from officers and detectives uh, from the Westerville Police Department, is that uh, the defendant's statements jump around. The timeline is unclear, his own timeline, where individuals were is unclear, and that seemingly statements are made initially uh, to control the situation. We expect your testimony of that today. Shortly after, uh, actually that day as well as going forward, uh, you'll hear from uh, numerous uh, individuals that uh, were part of the search process to find Emily Noble. Uh, we expect you'll hear through testimony that uh, individuals that were part of that search process may have never even met the defendant. So then I met him one time when they initially went and got flyers very early on in the investigation or when the uh, disappearance first happened, but otherwise didn't see or even meet the defendant while these searches occurred for almost four months. You'll hear about these searches that police were involved, friends were involved, people that had never met Emily were involved because they wanted to do their part to help. Uh, they were searching close by, further away, woods, water, basically any area that they could think of. We also expect that you'll hear testimony over the next two weeks of some uh, cell phone forensics that were done on the cell phones, attempts by law enforcement to put a timeline of events together. And again, as we uh, go through that evidence, you'll see, or we expect that you'll see, the discrepancies that are occurring during this time period, not only leading up to uh, Emily's disappearance, but also the night in question on the 24th and the 25th. September 16th, 2020, is when you'll find out that the remains of Emily Noble were first located. What you'll hear is that three ladies, one of which knew Emily, uh, one was the sister of that individual, and then a third person that had never met Emily in her life, were searching a wooded area uh, that was nearby the condo that after searches that had occurred for the better part of three, almost four months at that time, uh, resulted in not finding Miss Noble, that uh, searches more close by started to occur again, places that were uh, thought to have been previously searched. Ladies and gentlemen, you went on a jury view yesterday, and what we expect the testimony will show, and I'm going to mark on the screen so that you have a chance to see uh, where we're talking about. I put a red X on the location on Abbey Cross Lane. Uh, that's the location you first stopped at yesterday, the home of Emily Noble and the defendant. You'll see just to the west, there's another red line there. Uh, the sh that little, what appears to be a street is actually the bike path that you walked through yesterday. And then that wooded area to the west, that direction, is the wooded area that you'll hear about over the next two weeks. The area that Emily Noble was found was roughly in that area where I just placed the X there. Now, you'll hear testimony from the three individuals that found Emily that they were walking down the bike path, walking in a westward direction. The woods became crowded. As you all witnessed firsthand yesterday, there's shrubs and trees and things all over the place, and it's not readily apparent how to even get through the wooded area. Uh, but we expect you to hear testimony from the three individuals that as they were walking in a westward direction, eventually they found the, the remains of Emily Noble, found what they were looking for. You'll hear testimony 
that they called Westerville Police, and at that time, Emily was finally found. You'll see pictures of the scene taken uh, from BCI. You'll see pictures of Emily and how she's situated. And what you'll see is that she was in a kneeling position under a tree that was about six, almost six and a half feet tall, uh, and was found with a micro USB cord wrapped around her neck. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that wasn't the end of the investigation. And you'll hear testimony towards the tail end of these two weeks about the physical examinations that were then done, both on the scene as well as Emily Noble's remains. What we expect you'll hear during the testimony uh, from the two experts from the state is that and we had bilateral fractures of the hyoid bone, which is a bone further up in the neck area. And they'll describe to you and show you where that bone is located, where the fractures were located. But bilateral meaning one on each side, so pressure on both sides. We also expect during the testimony you'll hear there are bilateral fractures of the greater horns of the thyroid cartilage, which is roughly an inch or so under in the same neck structure as where the hyoid is going to be. And again, uh, you'll hear testimony from uh, a couple of experts demonstrating where that area is located uh, on, on, on a body. You'll hear that there was trauma to the left maxilla, the nasal bones, the left side of her face, up by her nose, top of her um, lip area. And what we expect you to hear during the testimony is that these injuries that are described were all perimortal or at or around the time of death, as opposed to healing fractures that occurred <coughs> earlier in time or items that are or injuries that would have occurred after death. And we expect you'll hear testimony in that regard from many witnesses over the next two weeks, uh, those experts. Specifically of those experts, we expect towards the tail end of our case that you'll hear from Dr. Smock. And during his testimony, he'll go through you, with you his experience, his background, his education. And we expect that his opinion will weigh heavy in this case. We expect during the testimony you'll hear from Dr. Smock that Emily Noble did not die of an incomplete hanging, that the scene itself was not consistent with the injuries he noted, and that his belief is based on the location, the bilateral fractures, that the cause of death of Emily Noble was a manual strangulation. Let me expect your testimony based on his experiences dealing with these types of cases, his educational background, why you will be able to make that finding and demonstrate that to you. We also expect Dr. Smock will explain to you that based on the scene, based on the injuries, based on his opinion, this was a staged suicide, something that made it to look like a suicide. Again, if you read the end of that book and saw the pictures and saw Miss Noble the way she was, you may think one thing. But when you get a chance to hear about the characters and see the timeline of events and see the injuries and hear all this testimony, the ending is not what it seemed maybe at first glance, but it's far more complicated and far more real than that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we expect that what you'll hear during the testimony as well is that Mr. Moore, from the beginning, was trying to control the situation. That he continued to stage this scene other than the physical scene that you saw or that you'll see occurred in those woods. And we expect that you'll hear during the testimony that Mr. Moore, the night of the 24th, going into the early morning of the 25th, that very important time frame in this case, that 
between 1 and 4 in the morning, he's sending messages to friends. Stating he's taking a sleeping pill and that he's probably going to sleep in. Again, I believe the evidence will demonstrate that from the beginning, Mr. Moore is controlling the scene and trying to stage what eventually will be located in those woods. That becomes of paramount importance when, you, when we believe you'll hear testimony today of Mr. Moore and comparing Mr. Moore's original statements to law enforcement about when he woke up, roughly 10 or 11 a.m., and that that's inconsistent with some of the activity that occurred on his phone, demonstrating that he was awake far earlier than that, about 8.30 in the morning, and that he was awake even further in the earlier morning up until about 4 in the morning. So we expect that when you hear the testimony that, that there's a major discrepancy in the time frame. Uh, you'll hear a part of that today when you hear the initial statements, as well as when looking at the cell phone forensics. Ladies and gentlemen, we expect you'll find out during the testimony that that's not all. That the defendant sent a text message to Emily just before noon on the 25th, use the uh, Find My iPhone app, which is an application designed to try to find where someone else's phone may be. And that he did that in the, around noon hour on the 25th, instead of leaving the room that he was laying in, instead of walking through the house to see if Miss Noble was there. And again, we expect you to hear testimony that it wasn't for at least six hours after that, before Mr. Moore finally called someone and said, my wife is missing. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll see body camera footage from Officer Hollis today. Again, Officer Hollis is the responding officer on the scene. Uh, he came, had the initial conversations with Matthew Moore. And we expect that you'll see during that body camera footage that there's a specific area noted in the back of the garage that after some period of time, almost two hours after the report, Mr. Moore points to and says, this is weird. Something, some, this cord doesn't belong here. And what we expect you'll see during the body camera footage is that there have been things moved during the pendency of when Officer Hollis originally first comes on scene to when the defendant points this area out. Following that conversation and during that conversation, you'll hear that Mr. Moore says, this area is weird. This, I haven't touched it, but this, this, this seems out of place to me. Somebody must have done this. But what we expect you'll hear is that this is just another example of the defendant controlling the scene, staging the scene to make this look like something other than what it was. Now, ladies and gentlemen, after two weeks of testimony, you're going to hear evidence about cell phones, physical evidence. You're going to hear about the parties, everyone involved. And we ask you to be diligent in your review, diligent in your review of the timeline, how things go together, and diligent when reviewing this case and discussing. And at the end of the two weeks, we're going to ask you to see this for exactly what this is. And we're going to ask you to make a finding of guilty of the charge of murder. Thank you. Thank you. Please give your attention for counsel for the defense. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Uh, would you mind keeping the lights at that level? Do you just want the document? I
morning. As I introduced myself yesterday, Diane Menashe on behalf of Matt Moore, my co-counsel, Alexander Petrello. The state, I just listened to them for about 30 minutes, and they told you their theory. Their theory is, is that Matt Moore killed his wife. Don't know when, but Matt Moore kills his wife, and then somehow gets her body into the wooded area where you walked yesterday and stages her death. And then I heard the state go on to say that their evidence will show how not just was he that sophisticated to figure out those two things, but he then also uh, took great efforts to control the situation after May 24th and May 25th of 2020. Members of the jury, the, the evidence will show that the state's theory is based on speculation and inferences. It is not supported by the evidence. And simply, members of the jury, their theory doesn't make sense. Now, I know you were listening to the state's opening just as well as I was. And the judge has already told you that our opening statements are, are not evidence. They are just how we believe the evidence will unfold. But I say this, that in my 30-some minutes of listening to the state's argument, I noted that they didn't mention reasonable doubt. That is their burden. Their burden is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And we talked about that in voir dire. It's their burden and their burden alone. And the judge has already given you the instructions of law, and he will again, which say, if the state fails to meet their burden, then the only appropriate verdict as to each of the three counts in this case is not guilty. And here's why I mention reasonable doubt, and that they didn't mention it is because as the judge has told you, and as I talked about in voir dire, reasonable doubt is a doubt based on reason and common sense. And so I wanna talk about this morning during my opening statement as to why it doesn't make sense that Matthew Moore, and I'll call him Matt, that Matt killed his wife Emily and then staged her suicide. First, members of the jury, the evidence will show there's no physical evidence. You will hear evidence the state will put on, we anticipate, that law enforcement extensively searched the area of 46 Abbey Cross. Not just Westerville Police Departments, but the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations was brought in. A unit whose sole job, members of the jury, is to look for forensics. They're there too. And it's not just the house. And when I say the house, members of the jury, the evidence will show that they searched the entire parameter area. But the evidence will also show that exhaustively and extensively they searched the Ultima, they searched the Subaru, they searched the attic, with Matt's permission, by the way, did they do all these searches. They searched the bedding, the sheets that were in Joey's bedroom, where Matt Moore told the police, the evidence will show he slept once he got up in the middle of the night and he had to go to the bathroom, he slept in that bedroom. More bedding. They searched the bathroom, and this is why this is important, the evidence will show members of jury, and in particular, what was in the hamper in the bathroom, because they searched this too. The evidence will show that the clothing in the hamper is the same clothing that Matt Moore and Emily Moore were wearing on her birthday the night before, when she's last seen. And so what comes of all these searches, these searches that were made by law enforcement, not just at Westerville Police Department, but also for BCI and I, the house, the cars, the attic, the clothes, the evidence will show you that there's nothing. There's no blood, there's no tissue, there's no fibers, there's nothing. But the evidence will show it wasn't just people that searched all those places that we just went through. It was also cadaver dogs 
cadaver dogs that the evidence will tell you are trained specifically to come to a scene, a location, and alert when they smell or detect either blood, tissue, or any smell of death. The cadaver dogs, in addition to humans, searched all the areas I just told you about. And what will the evidence show that the cadaver dogs found? Nothing. There's no physical injuries. And when I say physical injuries, I mean to Matt. He calls the 911, as the state has said, on May 25th and reports that his wife is missing. I want to pause there, though. He calls 911, brings the police to his house. As the evidence will show, certainly, that that's what a 911 call does. Common sense tells us that. They get there, and then within 48 hours, they ask my client, Matt, to come down to the police station and give a statement, and he does. He goes to the police station, and when he's there, two of the detectives say, what about scratches or injuries on him? The evidence will show that Matt Moore takes off his shirt, not at the direction of the state, but he takes off his shirt. Now, before he takes off his shirt, of course, his face is exposed, and you're going to see a uh, a body cam video of Officer Hollis, and you will see what Matt Moore is wearing when the officers arrive. And you'll see which parts of his body are exposed. So he takes off his shirt, officers lean in. Hands, forearms, chest, neck, face, back, legs. What did they find? Nothing. And consider this evidence, members of the jury, or the lack of evidence, particularly after you went to that wooded area yesterday. The judge is correct to say that your jury view in and of itself is not evidence. But it is, as the judge told you yesterday, something for you to consider when you hear the evidence that, that's presented. Think about how hard it was to get down there. And I even just wrote what the state said in their opening about that area. So it was essentially shrubs and trees, not readily apparent it's even there. Now, members of the jury, again, our statements are not evidence. But what the state says they will give to you to meet their burden, hold them to it. Because as they started this morning, that is their roadmap. So there's no physical injuries on Matt Moore. There's no time of death in this case, members of the jury. The state has alleged, and the judge read you the charges, and the state has just stood up in his opening and said that on May 24th and May 25th of 2020, Matt Moore killed, the, or killed his wife, and then there's also a charge of felonious assault, but uh, there's two counts of murder and felonious assault. The dates are the 24th and 25th. There is no witness. There is no expert, there is no police officer, there is no lay witness that can or will give you the time of death. And I remember in voir dire yesterday when I was talking to the venire about dates and uh, attention span, and I remember saying dates are incredibly important in this case. The dates we know are the date that Emily went missing. The last she was seen is by a neighbor. A neighbor that lives across from 46 Abbey Cross, where you went yesterday. In fact, a neighbor that lives directly across the street. He sees Emily going for a walk that morning in her walking clothes. And we know the evidence will show, evidence that we will present, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But we know that he definitely saw Emily on the 25th and not any other day based on the cell phone evidence. So there is no time of death. We know that Emily went missing on March 25th is when she's last seen by someone other than Matt Moore. And we know that she's found on September 16th. We do not know when she got to the park or how she got to the park. But with respect to time of death, 
There is no information that the state will offer you as to that at any point in this trial. We will, however, present expert from University of Tennessee, who is a researcher at, a, at an institute called the Body Farm. And in fact, it's an expert that the state originally engaged in this case, and then the evidence will show decided not to use after she rendered a report. Objection. A fair characterization. Ladies and gentlemen, opening statement is not evidence, so therefore you will not consider statements as evidence to render your decision in this case. Please proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Vivaldi is an expert from the University of Tennessee. She will testify that the most you can tell from the scene, based on her training and expertise, and her work studying <clears throat> decaying corpses, is that the body decomposed there and had been there for a while. There is no time frame that even the best expert can put as to where and when Emily got to that scene. Furthermore, not only is there not a time of death, but the evidence will also show that there is no trace of Emily in that wooded area in May or June of 2020. And I want to go over some maps with you. And I know, members of the jury, you were there yesterday. I'll start with this. This, as the state just showed you, is the map of the general area. To orient ourselves, this is kind of the general area right here where um, Emily's found. And as you are walking up that sidewalk, you might remember seeing an electrical box on the ground. That can always orient you in the pictures that you will see. But that's the general area right there where Emily was found. And yesterday, of course, this right here is the bike path, walking path. And this, of course, is County Line Road. I want to talk to you about when I say the evidence will show there's no trace of Emily in the woods or May or June. You are going to hear testimony that on the 25th, when the police arrived at the house, Matt Moore voluntarily said to the police officers, let me take you to the area where Emily loved to walk and forage. Where did he take her? Where did he take the police? Right there. Their own officers will have to admit to that, that Matt, as the evidence will show, walked them along this very line. And then what happened, well, the evidence will show that area, that exact area. In fact, the police will uh, not only concede this during the evidence of this case, but they have all, all along in this investigation. They searched this area on foot three times three times in May and June, and nothing. But like with the house and the car and the attic, it wasn't just humans, because cadaver dogs searched that area too. The evidence will show, and what was found when cadaver dogs went to the area where Matt Moore took the police as Emily's favorite walking path? Nothing. The evidence will also show the individual that lives at that house right there, whose kids play in the back of her house, but right up to that wooded area, was home all Memorial Day weekend. The weather was warm, the evidence will show. She saw nothing. She smelled nothing. No trace of Emily in the woods in May or June. Furthermore, the evidence will show that there's no evidence that connects Matt Moore to this scene. The state has just promised you that they will give you the, the testimony of Detective Hollis, and I believe that will happen today, and you will uh, be able to see the body cam of Detective Hollis when he rolls up onto Abbey Cross on May 25th um, and, and interacts with Matt Moore. The state in their opening talked to you about this corner of the garage. The Detective Hollis body cam will also show you something else that's interesting. Is that in the camera, in the footage, the police are 
from the beginning telling Matt that he's a suspect, that they know they killed his wife. Right from the beginning. And so why is this important? Is because the evidence will show that if that's what the officers were thinking, that common sense and the evidence supports, they didn't lose sight of that guy. They did not lose sight of him. Not mentioned, but the evidence will show that on May 25th, because not only did they not want to lose sight of him, they didn't want to lose track of him. They put a GPS on his car without him even knowing. Because that's the whole point of a GPS, right? Put it on someone's car so they don't know we're looking or following, so that we could trace their every move at any minute of any day. What do they find from the GPS? Nothing. Further, not only is there no movement from Abby Cross and Matt to that scene, is that the items found at the scene, forensically, tested, in particular, the USB cord that Emily had tied around her neck. What forensics are on the USB cord? Connecting the cord to Mac. No. Further, there's no eyewitnesses. And I don't just mean eyewitnesses to what they claim is the murder, to the transportation, allegedly, of a body to a wooded area. There's no eyewitnesses to putting a body in there. And members of the jury, again, I say this, I know the judge told you your jury view was an evidence, but it's certainly for your consideration. You walked county line. You were able to feel and observe the amount of traffic on that road. You were also able to feel and observe whether there is a place where you can park on that road next to the wooded area. But there's no eyewitnesses. And certainly there was no eyewitness given by the state in their map. There's also members of the jury, the evidence will show no motive. And I know we talked about this yesterday in voir dire, that the state under Ohio law doesn't have to give you motive. And I completely agree with that. I also, though, as the judge will tell you, agree that there is a further instruction, that the absence of motive can be used by you in your determination as to purpose or intent. And the judge will tell you more about that, but it's, it's, it's critically important. Now, in the state's opening, they talked about Emily's bravery and her persistence. Joey, Matt's son, at, a, at around the age 18, hung himself with a cord in a wooded area about one mile from Abacos. About 10 months prior to Emily being found in a wooded area with a cord around her neck. There is no question that Joey's death was a suicide. That's what the evidence will show. His death was a suicide. And I remember during voir dire, one of the jurors said, you know, second most common death of juveniles is suicide, and Joey was a victim of that statistic. And the state actually and I will agree that Joey's suicide and hanging was particularly tr troublesome to both Matt and Emily. Both of them, neither of them could work. Emily took a three to four months absence from uh, her job. Matt... Well, you'll see there's text messages between Emily and Matt. Matt really was at a place in his life where getting up every day and just even doing things of normalcy was, was well, seemingly impossible. And the evidence will show that. And then the state talked about what Emily did, was that Emily then went to counseling in August of 2019 because of Joey's death. And members of the jury, uh, you will hear 
that when she goes to counseling, she goes because she is traumatized by the death and loss of Joey. She reports difficulty feeling sad and empty and guilty. She's paranoid about her husband's well-being. She's struggling with loss of interest in activities, with memories. She notes in her therapy that she has a prior history with struggling with anxiety. And members of the jury, the evidence will show she has a history of struggling with anger prior to loss, prior to the loss of, of her other loved ones. And she's starting to experience depression and notes that she's experienced depression before. The state in its opening talked about Emily's traumatic life. And I say this, you know, there's not a lot of things that the evidence uh, will be agreed upon by both sides in this case, but certainly that's one that I agree. Emily's first husband killed himself by shooting his head in 2011. A year later, in 2012, the evidence will show one of her very good friends killed herself. The evidence will show that. In 2017, her brother-in-law, by marriage, so Mark's brother, kills himself. In 2019, Joey hangs himself in a park from a tree. Trauma is, is almost an understatement as to what Emily had lived through. There is no question about that. But Joey, her stepson, and again, our openings aren't arguments, but the state said Emily was passionate about Joey. And the evidence will certainly support her passion and love for Joey and what that loss in 2019 did to her. Emotionally and physically. And then, members of the jury, at the end of 2019, you will see that she unexpectedly stopped counseling and therapy. And instead, she turned to what Emily knew so well, which was trying to find peace in nature and the woods. She would walk daily, she would forage, she would go into the woods. You will hear that Emily and Matt were kind of a bunch of hippies. Uh, they would, they would uh, collect plants, nettles, they would dry them in the garage. You're going to see pictures of this. They canned, they liked to forage for their own food, despite them living in Westerville, Ohio. She went to nature, the evidence will show, to find peace. And of course, it was nature where she was found on September 16th of 2020. Members of the jury, there's also no evidence of staging. I certainly listened to the state's opening that their theory is that Matt kills her, takes her to the wooded area, and then stages her death. And this is why, as you listen to this evidence, I ask you, members of the jury, to really use your common sense. Because the evidence will show that Emily is found in the position where you stood yesterday, under that branch. She's found with her water bottle next to her. Her hair is down. We know that because the way her hair is matted when she's found. Her hair is down. Hair tie around her wrist. She's in her walking clothes. And hair tie around her wrist, I just say, is because we know that the last person that saw her saw her leaving for a walk. She's in clothing that, as you look closely, right, is clothing that you would wear when you're walking. And you don't even need to look closely because the evidence will show she has her tennis shoes on. Not the shoes or the clothing that she's seen in the night before. And the evidence will show there is no question as to what Matt and Emily were wearing on the night of the 24th on her birthday because we have pictures, selfies that they took of themselves at the bar as they're celebrating her birthday. And here's something else with respect the evidence will show about, no, uh, with, about the staging. Is that as Emily's found, her right hand is gripping her ankle. You will hear evidence about the difference between a complete hanging and an incomplete hanging. 
But members of the jury, there is no evidence that that, stage, that scene was staged. And then lastly, I want to talk about where the state ended. Sort of the last chapter in their book is their experts. I noticed in their opening statement, they spoke a lot when they talked about their experts about Dr. Smock. <coughs> And as you listen to the evidence in this case, the evidence will show that Emily goes missing on the 25th. She's found on September 16th of 20. I, almost a year goes by before Matt Moore is charged. Living in this community, out on the street, almost a year. And so what happens will the evidence show right before he gets charged? Again, timing is everything. Dr. Smock is engaged by the state and he issues a report. As you listen to the testimony of Dr. Smock, I ask you members of the juries to consider three things. First of all, what he relied upon in determining his conclusions. His field of expertise and the opinions that he can and cannot render. Because members of the jury, I heard the state in their opening say, quote, and please always trust your notes over mine. <laughs> Dr. Smock will tell you the cause of death was manual strangulation. I ask you members of the jury to wait until Dr. Smock's testimony, because the judge will tell you that's what jurors have to do, is to be open-minded and wait till you hear all the evidence. Dr. Smock himself, under oath, will have to agree and will agree that he is actually not allowed to offer any opinions with respect to manner and cause of death. Only a medical examiner is allowed to do that. And the evidence will show that the medical examiner in this case, the doctor that actually performed the autopsy on Emily Noble's remains, that the only cause of death that that medical examiner found is that injuries to the head and neck caused her death. Injuries, right? Head and neck caused her death. Now, that's what the evidence won't show. And why I led my opening with why doesn't the state's case make sense? And while it's not my usual practice, this case is unusual in many ways. And so I will, my opening statement, tell the jury, you, each and every one of you, what the defense will put on as evidence. And I say I don't usually do this because I don't have a burden. I, as Matt Moore's attorney, Matt Moore, Alexander Petrella, have to put on nothing. But we will. And in fact, we're going to give you four experts and lay witnesses. And here's what a brief overview of what our experts will say. First and foremost, we'll call Dr. Bolte. Biomechanics expert, Dr. Bolte is the director at the Ohio State Biomechanics Research Center. He's an expert in the experimental analysis of human injury tolerance and mechanisms under different loading conditions. Here's the value and what you will hear from Dr. Bolte. Undisputed testimony. And it's undisputed because he went to the scene and tested the branch. And he did so at the request of the state of Ohio. And I say this, members of the jury, the evidence will show again, jury view, when you went down there yesterday, it was shown the branch. The branch where Emily was found is, is quite small. Quite small. Dr. Bolte will come in here and say that actually when he went down there, he as an expert in biomechanics thought there's no way this branch can hold. But he did two different tests. A static test and a dynamic test. Dr. Bolte will tell you that, and this is on video, you will see the videos. You will not have to imagine this. You will see the tests. First test is he slowly adds weights, increments of weights, to the branch to see if not only will the branch hold, but the rate of deflection of the branch. Static test, branch holds. In fact, the deflection measurement is two inches. That's how strong the branch is. Then, after he's tested, on the static test, he does a dynamic test. And a dynamic test, the evidence will show, is what happens if 
someone were to hang themselves and let their weight fall. Could it happen? He takes a crash test dummy, the same weight as Emily Noble, ties a USB cord in the same or similar fashion as Emily tied it around her neck on the 25th of May. It's on video, you will see it. And he takes the crash test dummy and he drops it. That's the bridge. Holds her up. We will also give you the testimony of Dr. Heather Garvin, a forensic anthropologist who is board certified. And board certification, the evidence will show, certainly matters. She's one of 100 plus individuals in this country who is a board certified forensic anthropologist. And she will talk about what the state said in their opening with respect to the fractures. Most specifically, the state just told you that there's perimortem nasal fractures. Dr. Garvin will say that in her experience, training, and education, that she sees no perimortem nasal fractures. She will also tell you that based on her training, experience, and expertise, that the bilateral fractures that the state just told you about to the greater horns of the hyoid and the bilateral fractures to the superior horns of the hyoid can occur in hangings. Incomplete and complete hangings. Now, members of the jury, you will not hear from Dr. Garvin cause of death because she cannot testify as to cause of death. Well, again, only a medical examiner can. But she will tell you about mechanisms of injury. We will also give to you the testimony of Matt Curtin. In the state's opening, I wrote down law enforcement attempts to put together a timeline based on the cell data. We will actually give you a computer scientist who is a cybersecurity expert. All he does is look at cell data and computers and peel back the onion to find what's there even when the users want to hide anything and everything. That's who Matt Curtin is. And Matt will tell you three really important things that, again, show that the state's theories don't make sense. He'll tell you about phone location history for Matt and Emily on May 24th and 25th. He will tell you about patterns of user activity, or more specifically, he will tell you how there are no patterns, patterns because there is not enough data. He will also tell you about the user browser history. All this evidence about how Matt is so sophisticated staging this whole area. What are his browser history searches? What are Emily's browser history searches leading up? Matt will give you that information. But I tell you this now, the evidence will show there is no browser history about how do you kill someone, how do you hang someone, how do you stage a suicide. Nothing. There is some browser history about, from Emily about going into the woods to find your soul, though. And then in addition, we will also give you uh, Dr. Vidoli, which I talked about from University of Tennessee. Her entire life's work is uh, studying bodies and their, their rate of decay and decomposition. In addition to experts, we'll give you some lay witnesses. Again, members of the jury, it's not our burden but nothing could be more important. And so we will give you the cadaver dog handler. She will come in here and testify and tell you what she searched with her dogs. She will tell you what a cadaver dog is trained to do. She will tell you the expertise and certification of her dogs. And she will tell you that they found nothing. We will give you other testimony we, we present, we propose members of the jury, but I remind you that we have no burden. And maybe it sounds a bit like a broken record that I say that, but there is no such thing when it comes to a case like this. The burden is here. It is the highest burden in the land. This is a criminal case. Reasonable doubt is based on reason and common sense. On behalf of Matt Moore and my co-counsel, I am confident that after you have heard all the evidence, that you will render the appropriate verdicts of not guilty. Thank you so much. Thank you, counsel. State may call the first witness. The yeah, state will call Amy Thomas. Thank you.
Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Good morning. My name is Amy Thomas. Can you spell your last name, please? T H O M A S. Um, where do you live, ma'am? I live in Alexandria, Virginia. And where generally is that? Uh, near Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, how long have you lived there? Most of my adult life, so uh, all but eight years since 1989. Okay. And uh, where'd you grow up? Here in Delaware County in Westerville, Ohio. And uh, where'd you go to high school? Westerville North High School. Okay. And uh, where'd you go to school after that? I went to Ohio University. Um, can you talk briefly about what your educational background is? Sure. I graduated Ohio University School of Journalism and Public Relations and worked for five years before getting married. And then I went back to school more recently. Um, and generally speaking, what do you do for a living? I work in information technology. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your family first. Um, so who were your parents? Uh, Lester and Ruth Ann Noble. And uh, where did they live? Uh, Westerville, Ohio, Genoa Township. And how long did they live in Westerville? Uh, well, they met in high school. I know my mom moved to Westerville about then. My dad was born in Westerville, so their entire lives. Do you have any siblings? I do, an older brother and my sister, Emily. Uh, who's your older brother? Andrew Noble. And how much older is he than you? I think six years. Okay. Uh, and then you mentioned your sister, Emily. Yes. And is she older or younger than you? She's one year younger. I'm sorry to do this, but I got to ask you, what's your birthday? May 26th. And uh, what year? 1967. Okay. And that would make you how old today? 55. Um, and you mentioned that Emily is a year younger than you are? Yes. When was Emily's birthday? May 24th. Of 19... 1968. Okay. So, not two, not two days shy of being a year two, apart. Yes. Um, tell us about that. Um, that's one of my favorite memories or commonalities with my sister. Um, she came home from the hospital on my birthday and I had stayed with my grandma for two days and she gave me a doll and taught me to touch her gently on the nose and say my baby and so that's exactly what I did when I first saw Emily as I touched her on the nose and said my baby. And my mother said she spent the next two years saying to me, that's my baby. But that was um, a special moment and one we relived every year. Not the, I mean, not the my baby part, but celebrating the fact that we were the same age and had that special two days together. So when Emily would have a birthday on May 24th, on the 24th and 25th, and you would be the same numerical age yep. for those two days. Yes. Okay. Until you would turn a year older on the on May 26th. Which she was happy to remind me. So, <laughs> so on the 24th, I usually called her and said, you know, happy birthday, sister. We're the same age today. Then on the 25th, at some point, she'd call me and say, hey, sister, we're the same age today. And then on the 26th, she would call me and say, hey, happy birthday. <laughs> I'm younger, as though to say I'm younger again. Was that um, time always a special time for yes. the two of you? Um, yes, in fact, I can say that no matter what had happened during the year, that that day was sacred. I mean, that always happened every single year. Yeah, may I approach with us to be marked as stages of one? Do the one? Yeah, yes. I mean, I'm handing you uh, photographs of marked stages of one. Take a minute to look that over. Uh, do you recognize that individual? I do. And who is that? That's my sister, Emily Noble. I got this time that's the published stages of one of the jury. No, no jury. Uh, for the record, we're now uh, showing season one up on the overhead. Uh, so again, can you tell the jury then who this is? This is my sister, Emily Ann Noble. 
Um, how would you describe Emily? Um, uh, she always came up to here on me, so she's small of stature, but I would say that in terms of personality, there are always three main things that would come to mind for me, and the first is uh, she was courageous and strong. The other is that she really loved nature and the outdoors, and um, I, any story I would tell about us growing up would involve those two ideas. But since she's been gone, I realized how very social she was, and I didn't realize the extent until she was gone. And how did you find that out? Uh, well, the day that I found out she was missing, I reached out. I just jotted down a list of about, I don't know, eight names immediately came to mind. And I called each of them, and it spread out from there, people calling me, and, and it became a, a large part of my day interacting with dozens and dozens of people. And then I looked on her Facebook page, and she had just shy of a thousand friends, and I didn't realize that, but a lot. Um, I want to talk about some of the events and things that occurred in Emily's life over the years. Okay. So um, I want to talk first about kind of some of the friends that she had in, in the 90s. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The 90s would be, well, I first moved to D.C., so when I first moved to D.C., the friend that immediately comes to mind is Derek Hayes. She had dated um, his brother and became very close with both of them, and he was dying of HIV AIDS. And she brought him to my home where I lived with three other women, and he shared about his illness with us, and it was life-altering for me. Um, to hear that. I was a, with a conservative Christian and we were um, a household of conservative Christians and it really uh, was helpful to hear and put a face to that horrible disease and it changed my thinking entirely. And that's pretty typical of the friends that I met of Emily's. That was the first friend of hers who died that I remember. But I met other friends that she would bring to the house for Thanksgiving or a family cookout and say, hey, this is Rex, or hey, this is Karen. And they were just fun and lively people and characters. I remember Rex was, came to our house with overalls without a shirt and just had all kinds of funny stories to tell. And that was the second friend I remember her saying that died one day. I asked how he was doing. Um, Would you so that's those are the ones that come to mind in the 90s. Would you say then that she was... Confronted with death. Objection, Your Honor. Deleted. Rephrase your question. Was she around uh, death even at an early age because of her association with those people? Yes. Um, was Emily ever married? Yes. And can you tell us uh, who she first got married to? Yes, yeah, she first married Mark Farmelo, a local musician, and I've. That was in 2008, and I'm trying to remember when they met, and I don't remember, but they were in the, had many common friends in the music scene, and so they eloped in Vegas, and that summer when my family and I came to Ohio, we had a big reception, and that's how I met. I believe I, I don't remember exactly when I first met him, but I definitely remember that event and subsequent ones when we visited Ohio. Um, tell us about how Emily was acting or feeling emotionally at that time after her marriage to Mark. Oh, very happy. They were like two peas in a pod. They dressed alike. They had similar expressions. They even, I remember one day watching them go out the door and they both had like a shoulder satchel on and like they have matching bags. Who does that? And it was very, it was very cute. They were both kind of reserved, quiet people. You mentioned they dressed similar. Anything you could tell us generally about the way your sister Emily would dress? Well, a black jacket, a black hat and black pants. Was that always sort of her style or yeah, the kind of thing she, she liked to wear? Yes. 
She had some white t-shirts and a, a pair of red shorts, I remember. <laughs> I never saw her wear them, but I saw them in her closet. Um, how did Emily's relationship with Mark end? Uh, he, he took his own life. And do you remember when that was? It was in 2011, I think October. Um, did you come back to Ohio after that occurred? I did. And did you have conversations with Emily about what had happened? Yes, we, and, yes, at my parents' house. So, uh, again, focusing on kind of her emotions, her state of mind, how, how was she at that time? I'll allow it at this point. Go ahead. So, again, focus on the state of mind or emotions. Can you tell us how she was? Yeah, it? she was devastated. She was very sad. Um, listless and despondent are the words that came to mind. Wondering how do I, you know, how, how do I deal with this? I remember um, pulling out a list from an online organization that just showed, like, these are the steps to follow. I said, well, here's a checklist. Let's start going through it. And it was, it was not fun, but I remember also sitting at her home. And he, uh, Mark, worked in model airplanes, really those very intricate ones, and they were hanging and sitting on the coffee table. And she just said, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with those? And it was a stack of guitars. So it was... Um, it was sad. That's the main word that comes to mind. Um, did you talk to her about any thoughts she might be having about harming herself? I did. Um, I remember before leaving, um, telling her goodbye and just asking her, you know, should I check in on you? Do you, how are you doing? She said, I'm doing okay. I said, do you have any thoughts of harming yourself or others? And she said, no. I don't. Um, I want to talk again about your um, dad, Lester. Yes. Uh, is he alive? Today? No, he is deceased. And when did he pass away? 2015. Uh, he fell in May and had surgery and never recovered from it, and he died in June of 2015. Um. And where was that that, that he fell? In, in the, at their home in, in the yard in Westerville, Ohio. Um, what did your mom do with that property then after your dad passed away? Um, after he died, she put it on the market. Emily, yeah, Emily and I helped clean it out, but mostly Emily. Um, and she put it on the market and sold it and bought a condo in Westerville. And where was that condo located? Uh, in the crossing, so County Lane Road and State. And so um, we're going to hear testimony about that uh, location at 46 Abbey Cross. That was uh, the condo that initially belonged to your mother? Yes. Okay. Um, is your mom still alive? No. And when did your mom pass away? Uh, mom passed away in 2016 in June. So less than a year after your dad passed away? That is correct. Um, what do you remember about that time? Um, Emily knew before I did. Uh, my phone had broken, and so my kids ca came to my home and woke me up, and then the police came to the door and said, your, your mom is dead. And so I kind of piecemeal put it together in the middle of the night that she had died in a car accident coming from Southeast Ohio back to Delaware, um, and no one knew who she was, and um, so it took a little bit of time for them to piece it together, but she was planning to meet friends in Westerville uptown for dinner, including Emily, and when she didn't show up, Emily walked over to the police department and said, help me find my mom. Did you, uh Come back to Ohio after your mom died? Yes, not right away, about two days later. And um, did you interact with your sister Emily then at that time? Yes, we met at mom's 
place there at the condo. And I'll just never forget walking in and she met me out in front. I actually didn't know the address of this by heart because it was, anytime I drove in, mom would be standing in the front yard and mom wasn't there, but there was Emily. And got out of the car and we just hugged, cried. Um, we went in the condo and it was so quiet and right there on the counter was a coupon for a car wash and a coupon for the restaurant. So we knew exactly what her plans were that night. And um, yeah, that's what I remember about mom dying initially. Did you have conversations with Emily at that time about how she was doing physically or emotionally? Yes, we both had conversations with each other. It was a lot. And Emily was uh, much, she, mom loves all three of her kids, but Emily and mom had a special relationship. They really did. Um, and before I left, I said, are you thinking about harming yourself or others? She just looked me in the eye and said, no, Amy, I wouldn't do that to you. I know what that feels like. Um, so it was hard and sad. Hard and sad time. I actually got the house ready for Emily to move in. Um, it was hard. So after lots of thoughts are going through my mind about that. So after your mom passed away, Emily moved into that condo on Abbey Cross. Yes, Emily was the executrix of her will, and so I cleaned out mom's room and donated things to places mom would want and to make the space for Emily to move in. And she administered the estate from there. Uh, and so as the siblings uh, divided up any inheritance, the condo was a portion of her inheritance? Yeah, we jointly inherited it and she bought us out. Um, going ahead then after she was living in that condo, uh, was Emily working somewhere? Yes. Uh, Emily was working for the state of Ohio. Uh, and do you know in what capacity? I don't remember her job title, but she worked for the Department of Medicaid. Uh -huh. Medicare? Medicare. Okay. So. Um, at some point, did you become aware that uh, Emily knew somebody named Matt Moore? Oh, yes. And can you tell us uh, when you first met Matt? Yes. It was um, in, I believe it was December of 2015. It was after Dad died. And Mom called. I was planning to come to Ohio to, um, for the Christmas season. I don't remember exactly what day. And I believe my children were with me. But what I remember is mom saying, you need to plan on coming in time for dinner because there's someone I want you to meet. And I said, really, who's that? She said, his name is Matt and he's Emily's new boyfriend and I really like him. Um, later on, were you aware of a time when Matt uh, moved to Ohio? Yes. I. I believe he lived in Ohio then for a time, and then he left, because I know, yes. Okay, so you say he lived in Ohio at that time when you met him? I believe so. I believe he was in Ohio at that time. And then you said that he left Ohio? Yes, for and a short time, because Emily dated somebody else for a while. And do you know where Matt went when he left Ohio? Yes, back to Las Vegas. Uh, at some point after that time in Las Vegas, did Matt uh, move back to Ohio? Yes. And uh, what did you know about Matt and Emily's living arrangements when he first came back? Um, initially, Matt was living in Emily's apartment, but it could have been that first time. But so, yes and no. Oh, wait, I do know. He was living um, at his father's place in Worthington, Ohio. I remember that because Emily sent me an email about, hey, what, what do you think about Matt and Joey coming to live at the condo? And I responded, I don't think that's a good idea right now because um, 
it's technically owned by three people, and there, if anything tragic were to happen, I don't know how all that would work. So you, it would be better to wait till the estate had closed. And I believe at that point, she's, my recollection is, she said Matt and Joey were gonna move into her old apartment. Okay. Uh, are you aware at some point then that um, Matt did move in with Emily in that condo? Yes. And you mentioned somebody named Joey. Who's Joey? Joey is uh, Matt's son. Um, how often, uh, after your mom passed away, how often were you around to see the interactions between Matt and Emily? Not a lot. Um, her, her funeral, he was there, and maybe one night we went out after that, and then I went back to Alexandria, so or back to Virginia. Um, were your uh, visits to Ohio less frequent after both of your parents yes. passed away? Yes. Um, did you ever observe interactions between uh, Joey and Emily? At least once, uh, twice. So at mom's. Uh, when I was still in town after mom died, I was there for three weeks. So I remember Matt and Joey and Emily and I went to the Duda parade. So we interacted then. And then I came back for a Ohio visit in um, 2019. And in the end of middle or end of June of 2019. And so I visited with uh, Matt and Joey and Emily then too. Um, generally speaking, were you aware of Emily's uh, feelings or emotions about Joey? She really liked him. Um, she wanted, she knew he had, one statement she made to me is, I really want to get Matt and Joey on my, or get Joey on, on my health care plan so that he can get all of the, the care that he needs. But that was one part of her caretaking, but she also just liked him. But she was also said that he would wake up at odd hours and wake her up before going to work, which annoyed her. He was a teenager. I wasn't surprised. <laughs> uh, did Matt and Emily get married? Yes. And do you know when that occurred? Yes. It was August of 2018, so 8-2018, but it was either the 8th or the 18th. It was all those 8s in a row, I remember. And how did you find out uh, that that wedding had occurred? She texted me a photograph, and on my lunch break, I looked at it, and I said, oh, did you get new shoes? Because <laughs> I thought that's why she was showing me this full-length picture of her. And then I looked at it closer, and I thought, wait a second, they look like they're at an altar. So I, I just texted her. I said, did you get married? And she wrote back, yes. And that was the extent of that. I'm sure we talked soon thereafter, but... That was the initial recollection. Um, we've talked a lot about Matt Moore. Uh, is Matt Moore present in the courtroom today? Yes, that is Matthew, yeah. And can you please point him out and describe an article of clothing that he's with? Thank you. Um, Is Matt's son Joey still alive? No. And uh, when did he pass away? It was early July. I th think this, I don't remember, I don't know the exact date, but it was the first few days of July in 2019, just a few weeks after I had visited. And uh, what do you know about the circumstances of his death? Um, it was self inflicted. Um, did you return to Ohio for a memorial service for Joey? I did. And did you interact with your sister Emily at that time? Yes. Um, what can you tell us about her emotions, mental state at that time? She was very distraught and sad. She was very worried about Matt. Um, just the impact of losing your son so close in time to Matt's mother that passed away close in time to that too. Um, 
think it was January of 2019, but I don't know exactly. But the caretaking part of her just, she was, it was stressful for her. She actually took many days off work. She used up her annual leave and her sick leave to just be at home and kind of invoke what she called as nature therapy to grow things and be there for Matt. Uh, were you aware of whether Emily was seeing a, a therapist after Joey passed away? Yes, she uh, said that she was seeking a therapist and applying for family leave. Um, did you continue to interact with your sister after Joey's death? Yes. Talk to her? Yes. See her? In fact, I checked in on a regular basis with her and Matt. I would text. Mostly I would text because Emily preferred that. Um, so it all kind of, I don't recall a specific conversation, but I do remember calling and checking on her. And before I left, I flat out asked her, are you thinking about taking your life or harming yourself or others? And she reiterated it again. Amy, I would never do that to you. I know what that feels like, and I would never do that to you. Um, I want to talk then sort of the beginning of 2020. Um, in your, in your check-ins with Emily, how was she doing emotionally, physically? She, uh, So can you tell us, how was she doing physically and emotionally when you would speak to her in early 2020? Um, so early 2020, there were a lot of emotions. I remember she was getting stronger and healthier. She was going to have some pins removed. And in about February, February of that year, I remember her, we did have a phone conversation. I remember her saying that she felt better than she had ever in her life, having all of the titanium pins removed. She had one in her tooth, I think, and then an ankle from a prior accident. And she was lifting weights and working out, and she said, you need to start doing this. So she got me hooked on some weightlifting and you know, checking in with her to send photos of my progress. Um, was, you know, kind of part of what was going on in early 2020. And then COVID and many jokes about how are you cleaning your groceries and some frustrations with what's really true about that. Uh, to your knowledge, had Emily returned to work? Yes, she returned to work part-time in October of 2019 at the end, I believe. And it, at some point she returned full-time, but I don't recall what day. Based on your interactions with her in early 2020, did you have any concerns about her uh, mental or physical well-being? No. Um, I want to turn your attention to um, May 22nd through the 25th of 2020. Um, did you have a conversation? Uh, did you have a conversation with your sister on May 22nd uh, about her plans for the weekend? Yes. Not a conversation, but a text message. A text message? Okay. Yes. And, and um, do you remember emotionally what she said about uh, those plans? Yes, she was very excited. She would reconnected with a distant cousin who we had met many years before. And she said that she was going to his place for a cookout. And I remember, I don't know if it was in that text, but she had told me they met in a foraging group. And I thought, oh, this is a good combination. Matt and Emily going out foraging, and this cousin going out foraging, and they're going to meet up on 
Memorial Day. They'll have a perfect dirt milkshake and forage salad. It'll be great. Um, in fact, I think I sent her a picture of a salad in response. <laughs> uh, and so she told you that she was super excited about that. Yes. Um, did you have a text message exchange with her on the morning of her birthday? Uh, of course. So I wrote to her as soon as I woke up. Um, I sent a picture of a little pig with a pinwheel out the car. That was something our family always said on the way home. We'd say, wee, 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 all the way home. So I knew that photo would make her laugh. And I said, you know, something to the effect of, hello, we're the same age today. Happy birthday. I'll call you later. And she wrote back to me. I believe it was... Woo, woo, 52 and fabulous. Uh, and so uh, was that the morning of her birthday when you yes, sent that text? Yes, that was May 24th around 8 a.m. And um, how quickly after you had sent her a message did she respond? Moments, within a few minutes. Okay. Uh, did you attempt to call her later in the day? Yes, twice. Okay. Uh, were you able to speak to her those two times when you called? No. Um, did you see any Facebook posts or any kind of other information about where Emily was? Yes. When I didn't reach her the second time, I believe that call was around 3 p.m., I thought, where is she? what are they doing today? So I went on Facebook and I saw a picture of her at the Field of Heroes. And I just said, oh, well, they're just out and about. And do you remember um, where you saw that photo? Like who, who had posted it? Uh, I believe, I want, well, I think Matt posted it to Emily's Facebook page because I saw it on Emily's Facebook page. To the best of your recollection, do you? Overall, go ahead. Go ahead. And uh, to the best of my recollection, it was Matt that posted the photo to Emily's Facebook page. If I may approach it with what's more, say it at two? Yes. Um, hey, you uh, photograph is more just say it at two. Uh, do you recognize that photograph? Yes. And generally speaking, can you tell us what that is? Yeah, that's Matt and Emily at the Field of Heroes. And is that the photograph you recall seeing on uh, Emily's birthday in 2020? Uh, yes, that's one of them, yes. Okay. There were multiples of the same type uh, of thing? Of, yeah, there was another one of her standing. Okay. Yeah, permission to publish Shades of a Two to the jury? Go ahead. Uh, for the record, I'm now showing Shades of a Two on the overhead. Um, can you describe again now for the jury now that they can see what it is we're looking at here? Yeah, so that's Matthew Moore and Emily Noble at the Field of Heroes. And uh, what is the Field of Heroes? Well, the, field, the Field of Heroes is a field where all of these flags are set up on Memorial Day to honor those who gave their lives for our country. And is that in the city of Westerville? It is. After uh, did you make other attempts to contact your sister on her birthday? Yes, I sent a series of photos at around seven or seven thirty that night because I was frustrated she hadn't called me. And uh, what were those uh, series of photos? That um, just from growing up years, from little to mid-teens, uh, different moments of life. My mother had sent me an envelope of photos or a relative had, and I just pulled them out because I knew they would represent people and moments in our life that would make her laugh. And uh, Did you get any response to any of those messages that were sent? No, I didn't. Um. Is that 
you described being unable to reach her via phone and not getting a response to the text was then, uh, just to make sure I understand the timeline, was the last contact that you had with your sister that 52 and fabulous text that you got in the morning of her birthday? Yes. Okay. Um, going on to the next day then, May 25th. Uh, can you tell us how you were feeling on May 25th, 2020? Um, I was surprised I didn't hear from her in the morning, but I knew that she had plans, so I didn't think much about it. And a couple of minutes before 8 p.m., the phone rang, and I knew that was her. She's going to tell me all about their foraged picnic, and I picked up the phone and said, we're the same age today. How are you, Emily? Because it was her name on the display of my phone. So you received a call from her phone a few minutes before 8 o'clock. Correct, at night. Um, you mentioned that you were a little you know, surprised you hadn't spoken yet. Why, why was it surprising you that you hadn't spoken to her yet? Because we both were early risers, and that was often when she would call. And I was hoping she would. <laughs> um, but it was COVID. I was quarantined, and I would, was hoping she would call. Um, and how do you describe your level of worry, though, based on what you knew about her plans at that time? Low. Okay. Low level of worry. None. Okay. Uh, and so you got that call, and... Uh, it came up on your phone as being a call from Emily's phone? Yes. And uh, you mentioned that you answered it and said, we're the same age, and what did you hear on the other end? There was a pause, and as I remember it, it was, Amy, this is Matt. I'm so sorry, Emily's gone. I'm so sorry, Emily's gone. Yes. Um, but you spoken to Matt on the phone before? Yes. You've been around him, we're familiar with his voice? Yes. Did you have any question that that was Matt who was the one on the other end of the phone? No. Okay. Um, after he said, I'm sorry, Emily is gone, how did you react? I said, what do you mean she's gone? What did you fight about? because that would be the only explanation to me of what he said. Um, and what was his response when you asked, what did you fight about? There was just a pause and it was not a real answer. Um, just that she's not here. She hasn't been here all day. Um, the police are here looking for her. Uh, one of her friends is on the way. It was just this series of um, statements. Uh, did you ask him whether they had gone to the cookout? Yes. I don't know if it was that call because that call was very brief, but we did speak again later. It, no, I think it was that call. I said, well, I will call some people. Did you go to Jared's? for the cookout, and he said no. I said, have you called him? And I don't remember Matt's answer, but I remember that was putting that person on the list of who to call. Uh, what did you do after you received that initial information that Emily was gone? Um, well, I had a sense of panic and worry, and I instantly started calling and texting um, I think I drafted a little note like, Emily's missing, her husband just called and told me, um, that's all I really know, is she with you? And I kind of copied and pasted that to this short list of people that I had. And then my phone started ringing off the hook. And uh, Generally speaking, yeah. who were those people? Who were you trying to reach out to? I, I probably couldn't recall the whole list off the top of my head, but I know right away that it would have been a neighbor we grew up with. Um, do you want me to give names or just? No, just generally. So a neighbor we grew up with who Emily was still in contact, um, a couple that were very close to my mom and dad who befriended us also, especially after mom and dad died, 
a cousin that she'd reconnected with recently. She called her a sister cousin. They were very close. An old friend um, who'd moved to California for a time, and Emily watched her cat, so I knew that person's name. Um, a couple of friends that I went on her Facebook page, I couldn't remember their names, but I knew their nicknames, and there they were, so I added uh, you know, a couple of, a couple of those people, and um, uh, two of the friends that I had met recently in Westerville. Uh, so that's about eight names right there. Um, so from I just kind of thought back through three three or four decades of people and who who would right away be somebody who would know me and be able to respond to my question. Um, I want to go back to the Facebook post that you had seen uh, showing you in Exhibit Two. Um, did you send anything in response? at any time after you had seen this photograph? Yes, I, um, I th think what I recall is that I sent that, it, uh, Matt and Emily and I had a Facebook Messenger chat together, and my recollection is I, like, from the page forwarded it, you know, you can go to a Facebook page and then share it in Messenger, and I said, I love this photo, or something to that effect. Love, I, th I think I said, I love this photo, I love you guys, something like that. Um, do you remember when that was uh, that you sent that message? I believe it was May 25th. Okay. Because I remember texting after that to Matt, it looks like both of you have looked at this picture today. So can you describe for me what that, what that meant to you? What do you mean? Yeah, so in Facebook Messenger, the um, when somebody, if you send somebody in a chat, if you post something, like imagine my hand is the chat. So then down below here are the little icons that represent that person's messenger chat. So I saw two little of those circle icons, and I said that they were different, and that to me was that both Matt and Emily had seen that picture. So their Facebook accounts had seen what had been sent to them via Facebook. Yes. Um, when was it that you looked to see if she had seen that photo? Was it before or after your, the phone call from Matt? It, well, I posted that afterward, but I uh, I should be able to see the time that I posted it, but I don't remember. It would have been before. So I would have looked before, you know, I don't recall the um, off the top of my head, but I, yeah, it would be visible in my chat, I think, some to some degree, but I don't remember based on the way you're this morning. Did you have a conversation with Matt after the phone call that he had with you? Yes. To tell you that Emily was gone? Yes. And as a result of that phone call, did you try to figure out when the last time you had had communication or interaction with your sister? Yes. And that's pro that, yes. And did you then send messages to Matt in that same Facebook chat that you had with both yes. Emily and Matt. Um, and did he respond to you? Yes, a thumbs up. Um, did he send you any other messages at that time, if you I don't recall. Uh, do you recall receiving any more communications from Emily Noble's Facebook account after uh, your communications with Matt? I know there were texts from Emily, whether they were between <coughs> Emily and me or 
in the th chat with the three of us, I don't remember. Uh, would seeing records of uh, the chat between you, Matt, and Emily refresh your recollection as to whether you received any messages from Emily's account after your phone call? Yes. purposes as uh, Slee's Exhibit 3. Um, I want you to take a moment to look through those. Uh, it's a four-page document. Take a moment. Okay. I said, love this, love you, love our country. Okay, so it's just some paper to get text. On Monday, so that's the 25th. Here, so that's the one I'm talking about. Oh, that's Matt. Oh, yes, I okay. see now. Okay. Yes, I can tell. Okay. So, took me a minute to okay. interpret that. So now you've had an opportunity to see the conversation. Do you yes. recall receiving messages from Emily Noble's Facebook? Account? Yes, I received messages from Emily Noble's Facebook okay. uh, messenger account. And that was in the timeline of things after you would have that conversation with Matt. About yes, yes. Turn your attention to uh, May 26th. Did you? Uh, let me ask this way: Had you received communications from people who were interested in going out to look for Emily? Yes. And did you uh, communicate that to Matt in that same Facebook chat that had you, Matt, and Emily? Yes. Um, and what was his response to you talking about a search party? This I remember. He um, he said he didn't want to go out and look to find her dead under a tree somewhere. That that's, isn't that what search parties are for? And he said he wanted to just let the police search for her. Prior to your sister going missing, um, how would you characterize your relationship with Matt? Oh, I really enjoyed Matt um, and his company and my visits there. I, uh, he's well-spoken, polite, and kind. If my mother liked him, that was enough for me when I first met him. And after they were married, I said, um, I have a nickname for you. I already have a favorite older brother, and besides that, you're not older than I am, but I have a nickname for you. You're going to be my more noble brother, which was a play on his name and my sister's name. Uh, did that relationship with Matt change in the days following Emily's birthday? Not at first, but yes. Um, and can you tell us how it changed? Um, Yes, there were, he just asked me to take on roles that I was not willing to take on. Um, how would you characterize 
your conversations with him in those months after Emily was missing? Well, in the initial days, it was cordial. We were, you know, sad together. We were strategizing how to look for her, uh, how to, you know, how to keep track of all the people that wanted to look and all the places that people were looking. And there were kind of two camps of people. There were the, those who only wanted to look for a body and those that only wanted to look for a living person, a missing person. And I wanted, I'm doing both. I spent many hours a day. So I, we had check-in calls once a day or every other day, kind of saying, where have you looked? Where have these people looked? Um, and then I got a map kind of set up to automate some of that process to make it easier to keep track of where people were looking. Um, he, at one point he said, the police have my phone. I got another phone, nine o'clock last night. Can you help me set it up? Because I had switched from one type of phone to another and I was able to answer some of those frustrating questions about how do you take a screenshot? How do you turn it off? Things like that. And so that was part of our conversations. Um, and then it was kind of frustrating too because I was asked, you know, can you give me a list of places to go and look? And I would give him a list and then he'd follow up a couple days later. Can you give me that list again? I'm like, wait, nobody's looked there yet. I've told five people they don't need to look in that park or that put up a poster there. It's kind of frustrating. But, you know, what, given the circumstances, I'm trying to give a lot of grace when I know what it's like when tragedy strikes and mom's funeral was a horrible display of the worst of everybody's personalities in some ways. And so I tried to give a lot of grace. Um, so but yeah. When I, when I first asked you about the change in relationship, you mentioned a conversation about him asking you to take on a role. Yes. Um, can you remember specifically what that was that he was asking you to do? Yes, it was like the second week of June, approximately. I remember he called and said, I've, I've appointed you to my spokesperson to the media, or I want you to be my spokesperson to the media. And I said, no, I'm not going to take on that role. Um, and how did he react to that? He was quiet and... <coughs> No real reaction, and as I recall, we didn't talk much longer after that, during that specific call. Uh, did you have another call where he asked you to take on a different role? Yes, within the next day or so, day or two, he said, I've decided that I want you to be my spokesperson to the police. And how did you react when... Yes, you do. I said, absolutely not. That is literally what you need to be doing. I'm, I'm giving them information that I have and that I know and asking them questions that I have, and you need to do that too. And how did he react when you told him that? He repeated it, and I said no again, and then in a menacing tone, he said, you need to think long and hard about whether you ever want to see your sister again. And I hung up and did not speak verbally with him again. That was the last time you had a, a verbal phone conversation? Yes. Did you have any other uh, contact with him via text or messenger or any of those kinds of things? Yes, he texted me uh, a couple of weeks later, um, again in Facebook Messenger, and was threatening my family with lawsuits for things that people were posting on Facebook. And I said, could you please send me links to this or screenshots or something so that I know what you're talking about because maybe they're not related to me or if they are, I'll talk to them. And he, yeah. And he couldn't produce that and just, I don't remember the end of the conversation, but it was essentially, you know, this is what could happen or what I intend to do or something along those lines. With the, I think he said defamation was the word he used. 
And was that the end of your communications with the defendant? No, we had one more text exchange after that. And what do you remember about that? He said, I miss our talks. And I said, I miss my, my sister. He said, can't you call me? I said, no, call Detective Grubbs. And I gave him Detective Grubbs' phone number. Did you have any other interactions with him after that time? No. Well, not by a text or anything like that, no. Um, I want to turn your attention to September of 2020. Were you aware of people who were still out searching for Emily? Yes. And um, did you know any of those people? Yes. Um, specifically, was there a high school classmate yes. of Emily? And who was that? Lisa Gordish. Um, had you talked with them about where they were looking, what kind of things they were trying to do? Yeah. Lisa wrote to me in August, and she has a you know, sister, and she... Um, was in Emily's class, but we actually had class together. And she said, um, you know, my sister and I were talking about how you and your mom and Emily would take bike rides or go on walks together. And we just want to get a sense of what that was like. Um, could you send me a few of those walks? So I drew them out on Google Maps and took screenshots and put out the steps for it and, and sent those to her. As I recall, there were six. And I made a copy of that and sent it by email, I think, to the detectives and said, you know, this group wants to look at some of these routes just for your awareness. And at the end of, after, when she got to the fifth or sixth one, she wrote to me and said, you know. Let's go, move on. So you had communications with Lisa yes. about where they were going to look. Okay. Um, did you receive a phone call on September 16th, 2020? Oh, yes. And, Many. Uh, generally speaking, what was the topic of that initial phone call? That remains were found. They found her is what a lot of people thought. What have you seen any photographs of the remains that were covered? No. Um, do you know any of the details about um, how your sister was found? Yes, a little bit. I listened to the objection, Your Honor. There's lack of foundation. How does she know details? She just said she didn't see photos. She, she was in the middle, I think, of saying how she knows, but I can ask her a different right, way. We need to find out. Right. Is it okay. uh, Did you obtain the 911 call that was made uh, when the remains were found? Yes. Um, and have you also uh, read the Montgomery County Coroner's report? Yes. Okay. Um, but beyond that, you don't know a lot of the specific details no. about any of the things that were found. Okay. Um, did you send Detective Grubbs an email uh, two days after the remains were found? I wrote emails to him a lot, so I don't know about the specifics of this one. Were you generally aware that uh, the remains that were found uh, were found hanging? Objection, Your Honor, is deleted. She said she doesn't have the details. I asked, were you aware? It's well, I'll let her answer the question. She knows. I was aware of what the 911 call said. Okay. Uh, five more moments.
uh, ask Detective Grubbs for a full investigation into the circumstances of Emily being found? Yes, I do remember sending an email about that. Um, I, why did you ask for that? Because I was absolutely convinced that... I'll sustain that. Go ahead. Next question. Uh, and just one other thing I want to go back and make sure it was clear. When you were discussing having received messages from Emily Noble's Facebook account, uh, were you aware who those messages were coming from? Were those messages from your sister or were they from somebody else? No, I assumed in the context that they were from Matt. Okay. So it wasn't, you don't believe you ever received another message from Does Emily? Your Honor, ask the answer. She has answered that she thought they came from Matt, if that's your question. And so the last communication that you had with your sister was the text message on the morning of her birthday? Correct. Okay. I have no further questions this time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a 10-minute stretch and uh, restroom break. We'll be right back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Please recall your court's admonition.
Thanks. Have a seat. Have a seat. <clears throat> All right. Defense may cross. Thank you, Honor. Amy, Diane Menashe on behalf of Matt Moore. We had an opportunity just now. I, I told you that I was going to ask you some questions about the email that you sent to Detective Gross. Is that right? Yes. And I, I, I gave you an opportunity to review the email should you need to uh, refresh your recollection as to what the email said. Yes. And you indicated that you had reviewed the email and, and you knew what it said. Yes. So I've got some questions about it. Uh, the email that I'm talking about uh, was sent on September 18th. Are we going to mark that? Uh, no, you're not. Uh, the email that you sent to Detective Grubbs was on September 18th, 2020. Is that correct? Yes. And that was two days after Emily's remains were found. Yes. The, the title of that email, as I'm sure you recall, was Westerville Body, September 16th. Yes. You write to the detective, do you not, with good morning. Following is a statement based on my professional knowledge and personal interactions with Emily. I urge those investigating to look beyond suicide. Do you remember writing Detective Grubbs up? Yes. And then you go on in the next paragraph. Do you not? To talk about your qualifications and your education, right? Yes. You mentioned that you have a master's degree, uh, that you have training in Mental Health First Aid USA and Youth Mental Health First Aid as well. Yes. And then you go on to email Detective Grubbs. What it looks like is one full page single space, two full pages single space, and then a few few lines on the next page. Yes. I mentioned your master's degree because you would agree with me, would you not, Amy, that memory does not get better with time. Yes. Okay. Because this was written two days after Emily's remains were found. Yes. And today's date is what? August 17th. 2021. So between 2022. 22. So between uh, September 18th, 2020, and today's date, would you agree with me it's about two years? Yes. So let's talk about the email. Because I heard you on your direct examination talk about two different statements that Matt Moore told you allegedly on a phone. Do you remember your testimony about Matt says, quote, she's gone. Yes. I trust then, two years ago, you included that in your email to Detective Gross. You didn't, did you? No. no. Nor did you include two years ago when you wrote a thorough email to Detective Gross asking him to follow up on the investigation, did you include the statement, let me get to it because I want to make sure I have it, uh, when he allegedly told you, you better do that if you want to see your sister again. Do you remember telling the jurors that statement? Yes. And that is also not in this incredibly detailed email to Detective Gross, correct? Correct. Even though, Amy, in the email to Detective Grubbs, you talk extensively about Matt and your communications with him. Yes. In fact, you agree that the second page is about Matt. You're, right? I don't remember. Would you like to, to refresh your recollection? See the email? I have a copy. Marking, uh, Your Honor, just to refresh, but I'll mark these defendants. Did you wish us to use numbers or letters? We use numbers. You get letters. Thank you. Defendants, good day. Amy, if I may approach. Yes. China witness was previously been marked as defendants exhibit A. Amy, do you recognize that? Yes. And and what does it appear to be? Just so. An email from me to Detective Grubbs. And when I've been asking you all of these questions, 
last five minutes. Is that the email uh, that you believe you've been talking about? Yes. And uh, if, you, if you can, turn to the second page of the email. And first sentence is what you asked Matt. Would you agree with me? Matt's name is in the first sentence? Yes. Uh, second paragraph, first sentence of second paragraph, talks about Matt's traumatic brain injury and how he struggled with adjusting after Joey died. Do you agree with me on that? I did say that. And then in that paragraph, and I just asked you to scan, how, you say Matt uh, frequently, do you not? Um, throughout the second paragraph, Matt's treatment, knowing from Matt. Third paragraph, first word is Matt, is it not? Yes. Uh, and then the fourth, the next paragraph talks about Joey's suicide. Is that right? Yes. And Joey is Matt's son. Yes. And then the last paragraph, of course, uh, again, about your urging of the detective. And in the fourth line, you're talking about Matt again. Are you not? Yes. So in every paragraph on the second page, Matt is referenced. Yes. But nowhere in the entire email is either of these statements that today you told the jury Matt made to you on a phone call. Correct. And of course, when you're testifying about text messages or instant messages, we have the actual message, right? Yes. And so there's no question as to whether or not someone said what they did because it's right there. Yes. Subsequent to September 18th of 2020, you haven't at any point in time reached out to Detective Grubbs and given him the information about those two phone calls that you told this jury about. Isn't that true? That is not true. Oh, so is there, is there... Wait, sub please repeat your question. Subsequent to this. Yeah, since 2000, or I'm sorry, since September 18th of 2020, have you sat down with Detective Grubbs? I have talked to him on the phone, yes. I have, have you sat down with him? No. And in preparation for your testimony today, did you meet with Detective Brooks? No. Did you meet with the prosecutors? Yes. Um, and how many times? Objection, relevance. Uh, it probably is, but I'll let her answer the question. Once? Okay. And so, and since this email, right, you haven't sat down with Detective Brooks. You would agree, since this email, you have not emailed Detective Grubbs again, is that correct? I don't recall. Correct. I'm going to go back. Uh, you know, and maybe I'll go here, start here, Amy. I want to talk, you talked about your sister. So the juror, jury is clear. Um, she goes missing on March, May, I'm sorry, May 25th, 2020. Um, you are living in D.C. The last time you had been to Ohio was the summer of 2019. Correct. So a year prior was the last time that you had seen it. Yes. So let's now go to May 25th of 2020. You do not come to Ohio that day? Correct. Correct. Nor the 26th? Correct. Nor the 27th? Correct. Correct. Nor the 28th? Yeah, we were in a pandemic and we were quarantined. You came to Ohio not at all that summer? Correct. And so the communications that you're talking about with Matt and what you told this jurors about how you were managing searches, you were never in Ohio searching for your sister, correct? Correct. Have you even been to the Abbey Cross uh, house where Matt and Emily and Joey live? Did you go there? When? When they all lived there together. Yes. And that was in the summer of 19 when you came for Joey's funeral? Yes. And the two weeks prior to that? You, and, and in June of 2000, at the end of June of 2019, I yes. just told the jurors you came to visit? Yes. And then Joey killed himself? Yes. And I, I noticed during your direct examination, you used the word 
self-inflicted. Uh, Joey hung himself, correct? Yes. In a park. Yes. From a tree. Yes. Emily loved Joey. Yes. And when you came to the funeral, you saw how distraught she was. Yes. And Joey's suicide was an event after a significant other number of deaths in Emily's life. Isn't that right? Yes. I want to go through some of them. You talked about her friend in the 90s uh, that had HIV and death. Mm -hmm. There was other friends that Emily had, and you talked about if she would sort of take someone on and sort of like a bird, take someone under their wing and care for them, and then they pass. Is that right? Yes. And then you talked about how she met Mark in 2011. And it stood out to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, Amy, that you talked about how happy Emily and Mark were together. Yes. How they dressed alike, and they, the bags was even sort of similar, and they were taking on some characteristics of one another. Yes. And, and fair to say, I assume, Amy, that you, based on your observations and seeing them together, um, you thought they were happy. Yes. And you thought that of the couple, Amy and Mark? Right? You thought that as a couple they were happy? Emily and Mark, yes. I'm sorry, Emily and Mark. You thought that they were happy as a couple, right? Yes. Um, and then Mark killed himself. Yes. And that was obviously a surprise to you. Yes. And he shot himself in the head, did he not? I don't know. Did you <coughs> I know he I know it was a gunshot wound, I don't know where. And did you go to Mark's funeral? Yes. And then after Mark's suicide, Emily had um, a, a good friend kill herself as well, did she not? Not right. Uh, who? In 2012, the friend? 2012. Um, I know of somebody more recently than that, but I don't dispute that that may have happened. Who do you know more recently than that? A high school classmate. And the high school classmate is separate from her brother-in-law that also killed himself in 2017. Is that right? Her brother-in-law by marriage. Brother-in-law by marriage would be... Mark's brother. Mark Farmelow's brother? Yes. I do not know that he died by suicide. And if you know, Mark's parents, uh, they died by suicide? I don't know. And of course, Joe. Yes. And in between all of that, and I, I, I you know, and, and the state asked you about it. Um, I don't think, excuse me, Mark Farmelow's mother isn't dead, I don't think. Okay, she's alive. Well, you said that she committed suicide. I think, tell me if you think she's alive. I thought she was alive. Okay. And his brother? I believe he's deceased. Okay. Uh, with respect to the other kind of deaths that Emily, uh, you know, experienced, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I mean, separate from her own, in, in sort of in between all that, in 15 and 16, and Amy, tell me if I'm wrong, but your your parents also passed, your, your dad? Yes. And then I think your mother was tragically killed in a car accident. Yes. And that was in 17. 16. 16. And then you're aware just before Joey's death that Matt's mom died. Yes. That's a significant amount of loss. It is. It's a significant amount of suicide. Yes. I want to go uh, back to his hand. Sort of some of the and I know you, um, you, your testimony was that you weren't here. And we can just leave the lights off if you don't mind, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. I know that you weren't here, but um, just generally, you're familiar with where Abby Cross uh, Lane was and where Emily and Matt lived? Yes. And uh, you're aware, are you not, that Emily's remains were found in this wooded area right here? Yes. Have you seen this map before? This particular map? Yeah. I've seen, yes, on Google, not this particular map you, till today, but yes, I've seen Google Maps. And I asked you, because I'm just wondering, I, I assume you're aware 
that on May 25th, after Matt called the 911 and reported Emily missing, that Matt took the detectives along this red line right here and told the detectives that this was Emily's favorite place to walk and to go in here and forage. No, I'm not aware of that. You're not aware of that? No. <laughs> You talked about how you were aware that Emily, after Joey's suicide, started to go to counseling. Yes. Um, and I assume, based on your testimony, um, you knew that um, when she, she went to counseling because she reported uh, difficulty after the tragic loss and she was traumatized by more death and loss in her life. Does that sound about right? Uh, those were not the words she used with me. Okay. So she told you that she went to counseling. She started to go to counseling. Yes. And that was after Joey died. Yes. And she told you that because of uh, what she was experiencing as a result of Joey's death, she was going to apply for family medical leave. Is that right? Correct. And she did just that. Yes. And she didn't work for three or four months. Is that right? Correct. And I assume you know, based on your testimony about uh, your relationship and closeness with Emily, that she had a history of depression. No. You didn't, you didn't know that she had suffered from depression and had been diagnosed with depression? No. And that's not something that she shared with you? <clears throat> not that particular issue, no. I remember when you were describing Emily on your direct examination. And you said that she was courageous um, and, and she loved nature. Um, there was a point in time when she stopped going to therapy, was there not? In 2019? I was not aware of that, no. So, so you didn't, Emily never told you that she just stopped going to therapy at the end of 2019? No. And so was it your understanding then, as her sister living in Washington, D.C., that she was still going to therapy up until... Uh, her death? Yes. If she wasn't, would you have wanted to know that, Amy? No. Let's talk about Matt. Because I know the state asked you about your relationship with Matt. And I know I asked you about May 25th and 26th and 27th, and we know that you weren't in Ohio that summer. Um, fair to say that the first time that you communicate with Detective Grubbs is when you call on June 11th. Does that sound right? Yes, I believe that's correct. I just want to make sure that the juror understands the timeline. No, I, I communicated with him before. I'm not, what is the significance of June 11th? Well, sort of the way that, that it goes is that I ask you the question, if you don't, then right. just let me know. Oh, don't. One moment sure. while I think. I will say in early June, I called Westerville Police Department, or I spoke with Detective Grubbs in early June. I do not remember the date. And fair enough, because it's some time ago, right? It's obviously as we talk about but in June of 2020, uh, there was a call between you and Detective Grubbs, was there not? Yes. And you realized, Amy, that when Detective Grubbs was calling you, that your sister had been missing for a week or two or an extended period of time. Yes. And you knew that you were talking to the individual that was the lead investigator on the case, did you not? Yes. And you told Detective Grubbs did you not, that you thought or Emily had gotten angry and left, <clears throat> but you couldn't figure out what she would be mad at since Matt Moore was a grizzly bear. Remember telling Detective Brothers? That sounds about right at that point in time, yes. So as of June-ish, early June, your sister's been missing a week or two weeks? 
Yes. You talk to the detective, and you say you think that she got angry and left. I'm not sure why, but the reason why you're not sure why is because Matt's a grizzly bear. Like he's a nice guy, huh? Yes. And there's some questions about the relationship of Emily and her brother, and I ask you this because you mentioned that you have a sibling, an older brother. Yes. And isn't it true that Detective Groves asked you about um, trauma in Emily's life that she may have experienced with respect to sexual abuse? Yes. Specifically, he Objection. asked... Objection. Well, I have a question. Specifically, he asked you about uh, being, her being sexually abused by a family member. Do you remember that? Objection, Rob. I'm not sure. I, can we approach it with a few minutes more? Yes. Yes. Uh, were you aware that Emily uh, had any history of abuse, physical or uh, sexual abuse? Objection. Sustained. And in your conversation with Detective Grubbs, did you not? Uh, he told you reach out to more, to more being Matt. to see if he would talk to him. Do you remember that? Please repeat that. Sure. Without, you, please use names. Could you please Detective use Detective Moore is talking to you, Amy Thomas. Right, I'm sorry, Detective Gross. He's yes. talking to you, Amy Thomas. Yes. In early June. And he says to you, will you reach out to Matt for him? Does he not? I don't recall that. You don't? No. Because I ask you that, because you said to the judge. Yes, correct, yes. So it's actually Detective Grubbs that asked you to be a liaison between Matt and the police. For medical records, yes. Because you told the jurors how Matt had asked you to play a role. I thought that was the word you used in direct, but tell me if I'm wrong. Is that the word you used, Amy? Yeah, Matt asked me, I believe I spoke to Detective Grubbs prior to speaking to Matt about that. So it first comes from Grubbs. Will you, Correct. Amy, go to Matt for me? Correct. But I, I, I don't remember that, but it's possible. I, honestly, I don't remember. Okay. Because, because your memory of that event has faded? Just give me a moment to think. Take all the time. Do you have a date for that? It's the same June conversation that we were talking about earlier with Detective Brooks. If my... I do remember a conversation like that. I remember it before the conversation with Matt. Because I... That's what made me frustrated when Matt started asking for this relationship. Because you were, you were, you thought you were being put in the middle. Yes. Yeah, and you were frustrated by that. 
Yes. Okay. I want to talk about your statement that you made on direct about you tried to give <coughs> Matt some grace. Yes. After um, Emily went missing, because you saw Matt suffering when Joey died. Did you not? You saw it firsthand when yes. you went to the funeral. Yes. And you saw Emily suffering when Joey died. Yes. And Joey's suicide, hanging himself from a tree, was about 10 months before Emily is found hanging from a tree. Is that right? Yes. And you know because you've suffered loss, and, and I'm sorry truly about your parents, you've suffered loss. Grief can look different in everyone, can it not? Yes. And sometimes, and I, I heard what you said about that funeral with a relative of yours, sometimes grief can take uh, a gentle form and sometimes it can take a different form, right? We're all different. Yes. There is no playbook on how we grieve with loss, is there? No. Despite, I know you talked about the list back in, back in time when you gave to Emily, you know, these are things you can do to help you move forward, right? Yes. But there is no any a playbook that says if we do these eight things, we will be okay. No. And as someone that has suffered from grief and significant loss, you would agree with me, would you not, that it's not just when the loss hits that matters. It's <coughs> triggers that happen, birthdays, holidays, a song on the radio. It could be anything, and it's almost the worst when it's least expected. Yes. surgery. She broke her, well, yes. Yes. Because the pins were the surgery. The pins were the surgery. Oh. So she, she had gotten the pins out, and after Joey's death, she was trying to take better care of herself, right? She was, she was trying yes. to get healthy again. Yes. Um, and I know when you were asked by the state to describe her physically, um, she was like 95 pounds, uh, 98 pounds, under 100. Does that sound right? I did not talk about that today. No, no, I'm asking you. Yes, yeah, she was about 100 pounds. Five feet tall and about 100 pounds. And were you aware, did you know when she had like the elbow break? <laughs> I don't recall that. Fair enough. You do, though, recall, and I know you told the jurors about how she had, over the years, taken to what you described as nature therapy. Yes. And um, fair to say that, that even in Emily's text messages or, or your communications with her, that's an expression that she used, right? Yes. Nature therapy. Um, she would, she loved to go on walks. Um, you said that, you told the jurors that she was an early morning person. Is that right? Yes. Um, she loved to forage. Yes. Um, and tell the jurors what, what you mean by forage. As I understand it, it's finding edibles in their natural location. So, she, yeah. So and you go, mushroom hunting is one example. Yeah, and so you, you, you uh, tell me if I'm wrong, you, foraging is you look for mushrooms that you can actually eat that won't harm you. Correct. Um, you look for greens, like dandelion greens that you can eat. Um, we grew up pulling wild onions from the stream, <laughs> eating them. And this foraging was something that she had really come to love. Yes. And something that she did with Matt. Yes. And it was something that they shared together. Yes. She found peace in the nature, did she not, Amy? Yes. You 
were asked, I know, about uh, Facebook messages that you had with Emily. Um, do you remember that line of questioning during your direct? Yes. I just want to make sure that you and I agree, Amy, that nowhere in your Facebook messages with Emily does she ever say that uh, Matt is mean to her? Right? No. Does she say uh, Matt hates her? No. Matt wants her dead? No. She talks about how does she not, that with COVID, she was working remotely. Yes. And you write, and I mean before May 24th and 25th, you, you write often, I love you both. Yes. She talks to you, though, about how um, Matt coated a shepherd's hook that held a bird feeder, right? with Vaseline, and she joked that Matt actually didn't understand the ancient secret to keeping squirrels out of the bird food. Yes. And, and that's just on May 11th, just a week or two before. Yes. That's what she's, how she's describing uh, Matt, is that right? Yes. And then I want to go to the messages that you were asked about by Mr. Sleep. You, you told the jurors this message where he talked about the woods, right? That he's not ready to find her in the woods. Do you remember yes. that? Are, are you a parent? I won't ask you about your children. But. Yes. And Joey was Matt's biological child. Yes. And do you, are you aware that uh, his other child had, had died of a disease at a very young age? Yes. And so his second child was dead in the woods? Yes. So it's from that context that I want to make sure the jurors know exactly what was written. You asked him if he wants to meet you somewhere to search, and he wrote, did he not? I am not ready to think that she is dead lying in the woods someplace, and that's what search parties are for, to look for bodies. But if everyone thinks it's for the best, then yes. Isn't that what Matt actually wrote? Emily? Yes. And then you wrote, sigh. Yes. I know. I'm still hoping a couple of her friends know something. They haven't responded yet. And then Matt says, I'm going to stay home and let the police investigate. They have her phone. I will keep you posted. Try not to worry. And then later he writes that his dad, his dad Palmer, yes. is at the house and so he can now go search. Remember that? Yes. Because he, he didn't want the house to be left empty in case Emily Objection, came Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. Withdraw. Uh, and then you asked about the clothes that she was wearing when you left. Do you remember that? Yes. And he said he did not know. Yes. Matt called you every day, did he not? After she went missing? Almost, yes. Constantly communicated with her as... as as the sister of Emily. Yes. Keeping you updated on what was going on. Or at least checking in. No. Did you answer his calls? Yes. I know that you were uh, shown a picture of Emily. Stage, Amy, we could. Uh, this picture was posted. Uh, this is exhibit two. Exhibit two, showing the witness was remarked to state's exhibit two. This picture was posted on May 25th, is that, or May 24th, which is your testimony? I commented on it on May 25th. But it was posted on May 24th. I don't recall. And your comment, as you told the jury, was love this photo, love you, love you both, or love you guys. Yes. And I just want to make sure the jury sees this, though. Um, I'm zooming in for a reason. It appears that Emily is wearing two necklaces there. Does it not? 
Yes. And the, the shirt of Matt's, it's a plaid shirt, red, blue, white. Yes. And it appears from the photo, and tell me if you can't tell, but that uh, Matt's arm is extended. Yeah, look, yes. At, at, um, and he's smiling. Yes. And your sister seems happy there, does she not? Yes. Point in time, and let me just show you this picture too. The remember? Mark, you have this picture. It's marked as your. Turn the witness that's previously marked as defendant's exhibit B, if I may, Your Honor. Thank you. Amy, tell me if you recognize that picture. If you've ever seen that before. Yes. Um, and. And what is that picture that I've just shown you marked as Defendant's Exhibit B? This is the other picture at Field of Heroes I was remembering of Emily standing there. And uh, if I can, I just want to zoom this in. Uh, and it's not the best photo, but I promise you, Amy, it's no fault of my own. <laughs> um, does it? Emily's not wearing pants in that photo, is she? She's wearing a mini skirt. Right. And a, a t-shirt a, a t-shirt that at least covers her shoulder? Yes. And um, that necklace, that longer necklace that you see on her. Yes. Um, she loved that. Was it an, uh, it was the, her birthstone, was it not? I don't know. And if I could zoom in on the shoes. It, again, it's not the best picture, but mm -hmm. do they appear to you, Emily, to be tennis shoes? I'm sorry, Amy? No, they look like hiking shoes. Like, like little boots. Yes. But definitely not tennis shoes. <clears throat> One moment, Your Honor. <clears throat> I mean, I know that prosecutor asked you at the end of your direct examination um, if you have been provided other details about um, the investigation or seeing photos, and your, your answer is no. Correct. And so I know in your email to Detective Grubbs, the September 18th, 2020 email, you urged him, look carefully at the evidence, including footprints in the soil, fibers in her hair, fibers on her clothing, digital evidence on her phone, her laptop, and that of her spouse. Do you remember that? Yes. Because all of those things to you, Amy, could have led to an important determination, right? Yes. And could have answered some questions. I hope. So you hope. And is it your testimony today that you're, you've never been provided with the information that all of those things were looked for and nothing was found? Objection. Ms. Stacy Evans. Um, I'll let her answer the question. Could you please restate the sure. question? Sure. I'll ask, I'll break it out. Footprints in the sto soil, fibers in the air. Approach, please. to do, right? To look for trace evidence, right? That's what you were saying you wanted so desperately the police department to look for, right? Yes. Okay. And you've never been updated as to whether those things were found or not. Correct. Nothing Hard to 
take a quick look at an email and be asked a bunch of questions about it? Yes. Uh, you were asked if you had an opportunity to look at that. You had a brief chance to review it, is that right? Yes. And then you were asked a bunch of questions about what was or was not in the email. Yes. And you answered, uh, if not, I may approach this. Copy the same email. It was a defense exhibit A, but I'm going to mark it as state exhibit four as well, uh, so that none of the parts are blocked off with the um, sticker. Uh, just for the record, state exhibit four, that same email we were just talking about? Yes. And you were asked if you recalled uh, whether there was anything in the email about. First of all, the statement that um, the defendant made to you when you first made the phone call. Yes. I would like you to uh, take a look at the first paragraph at the bottom, the first page of that exhibit. Was that? Oh, I did say it. Was that email written when this was fresher in your mind? Yes. And do you recall exactly what you said to Detective Grubbs in the email? Without reading it, do you recall no. exactly what's in there? No. Would, uh, does that uh, email represent a true and accurate depiction of what you said to Detective Grubbs at the time? Yes. I would like you then to read what you wrote to Detective Grubbs at the bottom of that first page with regard to the phone call you received from that morning. Should I begin with when my phone rang? Yes, ma'am. When my phone rang May 25th, her phone number appeared. Naturally, I assumed it was her calling for our special conversation. It was her spouse, Matthew, Matt, Lyman Moore. He said that he was sorry Emily was gone. He said she had been missing since that morning. That made no sense to me. And so, Amy, when you have an opportunity to actually read the email, you did, in fact, put to Detective Grubbs that that was the statement that the defendant made to you when he first called you to let you know. Yes. Continuing the top of page two of that exhibit. Did you also specifically tell Detective Grubbs that you asked the defendant what they had argued about? Yes. So now that you've had an opportunity to actually read the email, did you tell Detective Grubbs the same things about that phone call that you testified to today? Yes. I want to continue talking about this email. Uh, you were asked on a bunch of occasions where Matt's name, Matt's name, Matt's name appears. You remember that? Yes. And uh, do you remember any specifically some of the things that you talked about that Emily had shared with you about her marriage? No. I know I talked about them. I'm not. And again, would this email represent your recollection that you wrote down at the time, which would be? Yes. Would, would be a true and accurate representation of what you recall? Yes. You were asked also that um, if Emily had ever messaged you things about Matt being mad or other things of that, but uh, is that the only way you communicated with Emily? No, she, she did text me one word that I understood in context, but that was, I was not questioned about that. I'll we'll come back to that in a second, but as far as, you also have phone conversations with your sister? Yeah, infrequently. We, to be honest, we texted more than okay. we spoke on the phone. And that's fair. Did, was text messages the only way you ever came? No. Had Emily shared with you 
some struggles in her marriage? Only one. And what was that? That was uh, vodka. And what did that mean to you? That was the word she texted to me and that it meant to me that Well, if you can present a foundation for that, I'll, I'll let you do so, but we'll determine whether she can answer that or not. When you receive the word vodka, what, without saying what it meant to you, why did it mean something to you? Because I asked Emily if Matt understood a joke that she had described to me and she said no and I said why not and she said because vodka and did you in your email to detective grubbs relate that issue about Matt's drinking vodka I believe I did yes again would reviewing that yes I hand you again uh, stage of a four, uh, starting with there. the second sentence of that uh, yes. second paragraph. I did write that. She did not like her husband's use of vodka, and I surmised it interfered with his thinking. And then I give the example of that text I was describing. Amy, you were also asked on cross-examination about uh, calling Matt a big grizzly bear. Do you recall that? Yes. And uh, you were read from a portion of um, what Detective Grubbs had written down about your phone conversation. Yes. Um, was that the entire conversation that you had with Detective Grubbs at that time? You just called him a grizzly bear and that was the end of it? I, I doubt it. I don't recall. Okay. You're not sure if there were any other discussions that you had with him at that time? At that particular day, I don't recall. Okay. Uh, you were also asked a lot of questions on cross-examination about uh, not including um, the things you testified to about your phone calls with Matt. Do you remember those questions? About not... Not including in your email or not communicating Correct. to law enforcement the things that you now testify to. Yes. Okay. Um, again, do you remember exactly what was written in this email to Detective Gross? Not word for word, no. And is it again an accurate representation of your memory at that time that you now no longer have exactly what was written? Down? Yes. You again, paragraph two, the second paragraph, at the top of page two. Uh, starting with after May 25th, and then uh, stopping at May. Yeah. After May 25th, I spoke frequently with her husband. At first, it was pleasant. Then, on three occasions, he demonstrated a desire to control a threatening tone and name calling me in a text that also complained to my family about defamation of character that we were not committing. I no longer speak on the phone or text with Matt because of these negative and frightening interactions. So again, you were asked on cross-examination if you had put in an email or anything about those conversations, uh, and you answered no, right? Correct. And that was after you had only had a brief moment to look over the email and try to recall everything that was in it, right? Yes. But when you actually look and read the email, it is true that you did put the stuff in there about those conversations. Sustained. Is what's written in this email more or less accurate than your answers on cross-examination? More. You also were asked about um, 
phone conversations with Detective Gross. You remember that? Yes. And Do you recall leaving Detective Grubbs a voicemail on June 12th? Yes. And do you recall what that voicemail was about? It was about the request for me to be the liaison with the police and that particular statement of you should think long and hard about whether you want to see your sister again. And that was something that you did after your conversation with Matt and based on his reaction to you talking about with him. Well, I'll put it. Go ahead. Yes. You were asked some questions about uh, whether you came to Ohio to physically search for your sister. Yes. Um, why did you not come to Ohio? We were quarantined. And so did you, were you? Initially we were quarantined, and then subsequent to that we didn't know what happened to Emily, so I was a little frightened and worried about where I would stay and I was unemployed and couldn't afford a hotel. So there were m multiple reasons and my time at, I developed this digital way of collecting information and disseminating information that was <clears throat> helpful in looking for a missing person in particular, which I was hopeful Emily was initially. You were asked questions about uh, your communications with Matt. Uh, they were fairly regular initially. Yes. Uh, when did that change? Uh, after the that phone call about wanting me to be the liaison with the police and the tone of voice that he used, I just did not speak with him on the phone after that. <coughs> Finally, Amy, you were asked um, some questions or, or read a portion of a sentence at the end of the email that you sent to Detective Brooks. Do you remember that? Yes. And defense counsel asked you about looking for fibers in hair, fibers on clothing, digital evidence, right? Yes. Was that that entire sentence? No. Do you remember exactly the words of that entire sentence? Not exactly. Seen that email, that would be an accurate representation of what you actually wrote at the yes. time? Yes. And you, uh, States Exhibit 4, starting uh, at the bottom of page 2 with still and then continuing on to, mm -hmm. to the top of page 2. What I wrote that day was still, I urge an investigation to look carefully at the evidence, including footprints in the soil, fibers in her hair, fibers on her clothing, digital evidence on her phone and laptop, and that of her spouse, broken bones, crushed cartilage, and bruising inconsistent with suicide by hanging. It is my expectation a clear and true understanding will come forth about Emily's death. So. Defense counsel did not read you your entire sentence no. of the things that you encourage people to look at in this case. Correct. No further questions this time. Thank you. Are you cross? Yes, sir. Thank you. completely right. You also wanted to know about broken bones, crushed cartilage. By cartilage, you meant 
What, Amy? Cartilage is this part of your nose. Oh, right here? Yeah. Okay. And bruising, so hemorrhaging, right? Like if she punched, you get a bruise, and you put bruising inconsistent with suicide by hanging. Um, I said bruising inconsistent with suicide by hanging, yes. And then it says, it is my expectation a clear and true understanding will come forth about Emily's death. That was my hope. And then, do you see further? Because I want to make sure now to, to, to really include every single sentence. It says, uh, September 18, 2020, 9.52 a.m., and it reads, examples of how Matt ties, T-I-E-S. Do you see that, Amy? Correct. Okay, and uh, did you send Detective Grubbs samples of how Matt ties? Samples. No. Examples. Examples, yes. Okay, and so those should have been attached to the email that the state had? We have savers. That was... Um, I'm sorry, did you send the state examples of how Matt ties? Yes. Okay. Showing the witness what has previously been marked as... Uh, or what is being marked as Defendant's Exhibit C. Amy, uh, do you recognize these shoes? No. Okay. If I could, could hone in, is this a, one of the pictures that you sent about how Matt ties? I don't remember. Well, what, what did you send the police? Because nothing's attached. I sent photos that I saw on Facebook. Of how Matt ties? Yeah, of Matt's shoes that he was wearing. And those, how many photographs did you send Detective Grubbs about how Matt ties his shoes? I don't know. Okay. I don't remember. Call. You would agree, though, since we're being thorough, that the word you use is examples, plural, right? Correct. And attached to that is nothing. On these emails yeah. today, yes. But your recollection is you sent Detective Grubbs pictures of how Matt ties, right? Correct. Because that's important, is not? Injection, I don't. speculation. Well, that was important to you. It's true that I sent pictures. I want to go back to the email, and specifically uh, the scope of the questioning on re redirect. The paragraph, second full paragraph, page two, when you were asked about vodka. The state is so right. Let's make sure we have every sentence. It begins in that paragraph, does it not? Emily had shared some of her struggles in her marriage, living with Matt's traumatic brain injury and adjusting after Joey died, period. Yes. She said nature therapy was helping. Yes. Right? And then the sentence, she did not like her husband's use of vodka. And you surmised, Amy, did you not, that it inferred with his thinking? It, it, I wrote it interfered, yes. It interfered? Yes. That was your conclusion? Yes. And I want to be specific because the state's right. Let's be specific. You wrote to Detective Grubbs that Emily told you she did not like her husband's use, U-S-E, right? Yes. Not abuse. Uh, the word you use is use, is it not? Correct. Are you married? I'm divorced. Uh, in life, when you have had a partner, fair to say, Amy, that we don't always love everything about our partners. Correct. You just mentioned about the searches. And I think Andy, your brother, lives about an hour away in Ohio. I'm yeah. outside the scope. You asked about why she didn't come for searches, and she said she didn't have anywhere to stay. What is the permit? I'll, I'll permit that, Ed. Your, your brother Andy um, lives about an hour away? Yes. But, but about the searches, the fact that you weren't here, you didn't participate in searches. 
on the ground. It doesn't mean just because you weren't participating in searches that you didn't love your sister, does it? Correct. Nothing further. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you have uh, a question you would like to ask this particular witness, you may write it down, and if you do, pass it to the end. Becky, our court reporter, will um, obtain those from you. Would uh, counsel proceed?
Are you, do you know of the nature of Matt's traumatic brain injury? No. Okay. The next uh, question is, uh, did Emily go through uh, any type of therapy, uh, therapy after her husband Mark died? I do not know. Okay. Did she go through any type of therapy after her father died? I do not know. Okay. And the final question is, did Emily go through any therapy after her mother died? I do not know. Okay. Uh, you've seen Exhibit 2, uh, a photo uh, of uh, Emily and her husband on Memorial Day. Were those pictures sent uh, by email, text, or messenger? It was posted in Facebook um, on Emily's page, and I sent it by Facebook Messenger to a chat with Matt and Emily and I. Okay. All right. Thank you. Do these questions raise any questions the state would like to ask this witness? No, no. Defense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You may sit down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Becky. <clears throat> One more. One more then. All right, I think uh, this is probably an appropriate time since I've been advised that uh, we're going to have another long witness testify uh, for, for a midday break. So uh, we'll take a break, come back at 1.30, and we will commence uh, uh, the trial. I'm not where, – where do they go? They come back up here or they go down to the third floor? Down to the third floor. Yeah. Third, okay, go to the third floor. You, you've got the drill there, and then we'll bring you on up at 1.30. I remember the court's admonition during the break. Have a good lunch. We'll see you in an hour.
Seat. State may call the next witness. State will call Sergeant Houses. Spell your last name for the record, please. Uh, Robert Hollis, H-O-L-L-I-S. And what is your current occupation? Uh, sergeant with the Division of Police of Westerville. Okay. Uh, what are some of your job duties as a sergeant? Uh, administrative uh, duties, um, supervising officers and patrol. Uh, how long have you been a sergeant at Westerville Police Department? <clears throat> um, sergeant, one month. Yes, sir. Congratulations, Thank I suppose. You. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't congratulate you. I'm not sure. Uh, do you have uh, other law enforcement experience prior to becoming a sergeant? Um, as a patrolman I was for eight years. Okay. And uh, what were some of your job duties as a patrolman? I'm responding to calls, patrol, uh, report taking, things of that nature. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask you questions about... Um, May 25th, 2020, what uh, capacity were you working on or about that time? Uh, I was working second shift patrol at that time. Okay. Uh, what types of training uh, did you have to undergo in order to become a law enforcement officer uh, originally? Um, you have to complete a um, state mandate training uh, with OPADA um, and complete that course and be state certified to be a pol police officer. Okay, and OPADA is the, the training service for police officers? Yes, sir. Oh, what types of things did you have to go through or what types of training did you undergo? Um, firearms, driving, report writing, um, law enforcement, understanding how to apply probable cause and things of that nature. Okay. And once you pass that initial training today, Hand you a badge and a weapon and send you on your way, or is there continuing training? Yes, yeah, sir, there's continuing training. Um, we have a FTO, stuff for uh, field training, um, and that is 16 weeks long before you're on your own. Okay. And now that you're a sergeant, is there also trainings involved with that? Yes, sir. Uh, what types of trainings? Um, you, well, mine, so to speak, I've gone to training on day shift, second shift, and third shift. Um, strictly as a supervisor basis, um, responding to calls as needed, um, and supervising the officers on the scene. Okay. Um, so, like I said, I'm going to take you back uh, to about May 25th of 2020. Do you recall, were you working in some capacity at that time? Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, just remind me again, what, what was your position? I was second shift uh, patrol. Okay. And uh, do you recall receiving an initial call on that day uh, sometime in the late afternoon, early evening? I do. Okay. Uh, what's your recollection of the uh, nature of that call that you received? Uh, I was dispatched to an address on a report of a missing person. Okay. Uh, just one moment. Um, and, uh, Sergeant, was it your understanding that the initial call came through uh, from a 911 call? Uh, I'm not aware. Okay. Uh, your Honor, we uh, have labeled uh, State's Exhibit uh, 5 a 911 call and had asked to publish to the jury in this case. Any objection? No. Proceed.
Sergeant, you said then you, uh, after receiving the initial call and being told of the situation, where did you go first? Um, I responded to the residents first. Okay. Was that 46 Abbey Cross Lane? Correct. Uh, and uh, is that in Delaware County? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, who did you first meet with when you arrived on scene? Um, Mr. Moore, after knocking on the door. Okay. Uh, so you arrived on scene, knocked on the door. Yes, sir. Who answered? 
Mr. Moore did. Okay. And uh, what were your initial uh, interactions with him? Uh, I believe my first question to him was, did you call, um, make sure, obviously, the right address. Um, he stepped out um, of the condo there. Um, then I noticed someone pull, pulled up in front of the condo, and a female got out, and I asked him, I said, is that your wife? Um, and he says, yes. Then he says, no. Okay. Uh, uh, and did a, uh, a female then walk up to you as well? Yes. Uh, was that later identified to be Celeste Barone? Correct. Okay. Um, and after having a brief conversation outside, what did, where did you go next? Uh, we went inside Mr. Moore's home so I can continue my questioning about Emily Noble. Okay. And generally speaking, what were you uh, attempting to elicit at that time? Um, I'm trying to find out, did she leave um, because an argument, did she leave, this is normal for her just to want to be by herself. Um, I'm trying to gather information um, to lead me to ask additional questions. Uh, now I noticed while you're testifying today, it looks like you've got uh, some sort of device in the middle of your chest. Is that I right? do. Yes, sir. Uh, what is that? This is our uh, department issue body worn camera. Okay. And would you have been wearing that uh, back on May 25th of 2020 during these interactions? Um, one similar to this, yes, sir. Okay. And do the body cameras uh, pick up audio and video and record those conversations? They do, yes, sir. Okay. And uh, are they then kept and saved uh, in standard practice by the Westerville Police Department? Correct, yes, sir. Okay. And have you had a chance to review your body-worn camera footage? Uh, from this incident? Yes. Yes, sir. And to the best of your knowledge, does it appear to be true and accurate and complete? Yes. Okay. Uh, your Honor, at this time we'd ask to uh, publish State's Exhibit 6, which would be the body-worn camera uh, worn by then-Officer Hollis. Any objection? No. Proceed. <clears throat> I'm going to let this first little bit play. Uh, there does not appear to be sound initially, correct? Correct. Uh, what, what are we viewing right here? Um, I'm inside the cruiser there. I'm, my MDT, or I'm sorry, my um, computer um, is zoomed in to let me know exactly where the address is that I'm looking for. Um, getting out of the vehicle, and I'll soon activate my camera. Now, I picked a bad time to pause that, but in the top right-hand corner, there appears to be a uh, time signature on there. I believe it says 2206 and then 052, or 05Z. Yes. Okay. Uh, is that in, uh, I guess, Greenwich Mean Time or Zulu Time? Uh, yes, sir. I believe so. Okay. So uh, would this have been about 606 p.m.? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, 
here. Here's the log. I need some money. The phone's here. Cars in the garage. I've been up since 10, probably. 10 a.m. today? Probably. I'm guessing about that time. A little, little, little bit later than I usually sleep. And she just hasn't been here. I, I, I sleep in this room. I get up in the middle of the night sometimes uh, to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. seconds. The female that we see here in the camera view, uh, who's that? Um, I believe her name is Celeste. Okay. And then again, the individual on the left is Matthew Moore, the defendant? Correct. Thank <laughs> you. 
but you haven't seen her since 10 o'clock. I honestly, definitely. We were we were together last night. We spent the day. We came home. We slept together in her in our bed. I got up. I'm guessing it was early. Now, Sergeant Hollis, uh, when you're asking questions, of Mr. Moore, how did he describe the bed? Uh, how did he describe the bed? Correct. Just there about two seconds ago. He said that they went to bed in her bed, but quickly corrected himself and said, our bed. What types of information are you trying to gather in this moment? I'm trying to understand if um, Emily left on her own power or if there's more to the situation that um, has been presented to me yet. Okay. Uh, during these initial encounters in these types of cases or in these types of call outs, uh, are you generally asking a lot of questions or tell me about that? Yes. Um, we're trying to um, ask a specific amount of sp specific questions to get to um, what type of missing we're looking for. Are they autistic, um, do they suffer from dementia, um, are they suicidal? Um, just those basic baseline questions. What, she's, what is she wearing? Who are some of her friends? Where, where could we start looking? Um, so yeah, those are questions that as soon as we arrive on scene, we want to start getting so I can get the information to other officers as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, continuing now at uh, six minutes and 57 seconds. Usually I make like three before I have to get up to the bathroom. That's not like I'm saying 1231. Got up went to the bathroom, went into this room, fell back to sleep. Took a while to get back to sleep. I woke up late, like 10.30, which is unusual. I usually get up around 6. And I got up and she's not here. She's not Okay, you said you guys went to celebrate her birthday? Yeah. Tell me about that. What did we do? We went out to, uh, at the site of the town, it was a spring, a water spring. It's a town about an hour 20 minutes southeast of here. And I can show you on collected some water, about halfway back we stopped and we had a picnic, collected animals, that was our hobby. We got back in the park, came here, um, decided to go down to the uptown because we heard that things were opened up. Went to Colet, went to Bag Nails, and we went to Jimmy Beans. Came home. Went to sleep. Um, there's going to be another cruiser coming here. If you don't mind talking with him, okay. um, just give him some information before you go and take off and look at the path for me. Um, that would be very helpful to me. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you in, inside here, okay? Um, so, 50 to 74, how far are you? Uh, 
Uh, not at this moment, um, but possibly we need to search some bike trails. Um, 74 is going to get more info for me from the other lady out front. What's the phone number you have for, for her um, cell phone? Sorry, what did the, uh, Mr. Moore just say there? That she's never done this before? Right. Um, did he just say something along the lines of, I think she's going to pop up? He did say that, yes, sir. Is he the only person you 
know that you could reach that would be at that party? Yeah, I don't. I'm in the area pretty much. Okay. The only person that she knew was him as well. Okay. So it was a, and she, I mean, she would have, she wouldn't have went without a wallet and her phone. Okay. All right. So I see that the bed was made. Did you do that or she did that? That is, is uh, I just noticed that. You're right. I didn't make the bed. She did. Now, uh, Sergeant Hollis, why why did you take note of the bed in that situation? Um, up until this point, Mr. Moore has expressed to me that they both slept in the bed after going out to celebrate her birthday, um, that he got up, went to another room in the house to finish sleeping um and i was curious about the bed kind of trying to get an understanding of what her morning started out um if she started out like a normal day if that's something that she does all the time um and he was already in another room that would suggest one thing um another thing i was thinking was um since the bed was made that um, the story may have been that neither one of them slept in that bed that night. And are you, in this moment, trying to gather as much information as you can in order to uh, try and find Miss Noble? Yes, sir. Uh, for the record, I stopped the recording at 1521, and I will uh, continue now. So she was, I'm guessing, here this morning. Okay. Where was her cell phone? Was it with her wallet? Yes. Okay. Um, when we go on our trip, when we go on our little walks, we go up this road to the, the Constantine, take a left, and then take the first right. And it takes you to that white trail. Take a right and it'll bring you down to Common Line. Mm -hmm. Right at Common Line is the bridge. Right. Right along that bridge, there's where she likes to go with a lot of yellow stuff. So literally, she, that's her little walk. Did you go there today looking for her? No, I didn't. Okay. I mean, I, I've been keeping calm. So, Officer, uh, Sergeant 1622, uh, the uh, defendant just. Uh, Give me an explanation of the walking path that they would typically go on? Yes, sir. Okay. And did he indicate whether he had gone to look there at any point during his day up to this point? He said he had not. Okay. Um, okay. He might just going to pop up and then when I follow. Okay. How many bathrooms are in this place? Two. Two. And you check them both? I check the room. I check the yeah. attic. Okay. Alright. Uh, does she take any medication or anything? That she needs to take?
Sergeant Hollis, from about uh, 18 minutes and 31 seconds on your recording here to about 25 minutes, so roughly six and a half minutes, um, are you speaking with your supervisor? Yes, sir. Okay, just giving him an update on the situation? Yes, sir. All right, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit to about 25 minutes. Two seconds. <coughs> Can you show me your vehicle? Is it better to go inside or this way? We're checking the hospitals now. So, do you remember if the door was locked? The house? Mm -hmm. I would be guessing. Um, or did she? Our, 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 yes, our doors were locked. We usually need this way.
Were you best friends with her before they were together? Okay. So pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Um, she gets it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever known her to want to harm herself or? No. No. No, not at all. You never saw any signs. You never conversations that kind of make you go, huh? You know, nothing like that. No. Okay. Yeah, that's that's not good. That's why this is so bad. Um. She's the straightest, squarest person I've ever met. She does everything. She's taught me a lot just since I've been there. She's really meticulous. She's just, this is uncharacteristic. character. She would never go somewhere and not tell you where she's from. It's just who you know. I mean, I, I, I lasted as long as I could today. Just being like, she's going to show up, whatever. She's foraging, she went for a walk, she took a trip. Cars here, maybe someone picked her up, which I don't think it ever happened. I've never had it. Well, she would have taken her phone. I mean, that's really unusual. And she would have told you that she's going to come here or had a phone text. What was that name of that place you said you guys were at? Walt We went to the Colway? No, not the Colway. It's the Green place. Oh, the Green Colway. Oh, I mean, the, the place where you said, you said it was almost two hours away or something like that. Oh, yeah. So there's a spring there uh, where you can collect the spring water. Okay. Uh, these pipes. It's a town. It's uh, I, can, I can. You can show me that. Okay. <coughs> uh, Sergeant Hollis, I just uh, paused there at I believe uh, 31 minutes and 48 seconds into the recording. Um, and may I approach him? Yes. I've previously labeled screenshot here, Mark states is at seven. Can you take a moment and look at that? Yes, sir. Does that appear to be the same uh, still shot we have on the video right here? Uh, 22, 37, 24 Zulu time on your body cam? Yes, sir. I'm uh, going to keep playing here at 31 minutes and 48 seconds. Did it look like she had some food before she left? Were there any bowls in the scenes? Was there any? You know what I ordered? Each place we went, I ordered food, and I ate it. She's very small. Okay. <laughs> I had one too many good ones. So did she? She doesn't eat man. So she's really small. She's like 100 pounds. What about her shoes? Oh, yes, yeah, you mentioned her shoes last night. She wanted to make sure that I approved her shoes. You had what? Proofs? Would you be able to tell me if any shoes are missing? No. You wouldn't be able to tell me that or no, they're not? I wouldn't know. Okay. I wouldn't know. I guess. She has several pairs of sneakers. She has several pairs of sneakers. Yeah, no. She had several pairs of sneakers. So, is she, do you see the clothes that she was wearing last night? She was wearing this last night. What about top? Uh, Sergeant Hollis, 
Wallace, you asked about the clothes that Ms. Noble was wearing the night before. Yes, sir. And uh, does Mr. Moore identify clothing that he believes she was wearing the night before? He does. He picks up a skirt that he believes she was wearing the night before. Where were those located? Inside a walk-in closet. Okay. So what we're seeing right here? Yes, sir. Okay. That's not the bathroom, is it? No, sir. Okay. Uh, 33 minutes and 37 seconds. I'll continue on. You don't know where the top is? Yesterday, you guys were here in the city celebrating a birthday. We got up. Basically, the entirety of the condo on that day, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, you agree with me? It's probably close to 800, 900 square feet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Approximately. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, would you describe it as small, big? Some... That's fine. I withdraw.
Um, suicide man, I would, I don't know. I, my son did suicide. Your son committed suicide? So, uh, did she know? Sergeant House, uh, before Mr. Moore says, suicide man, I don't know, what's the nature of your conversation at that time? Uh, we weren't speaking about suicide. I was still gathering information about um, her possible daily routine. Um, I didn't ask him any questions about anything at that time. And were you still gathering information so that you could search for Miss Noble? Yes, sir. Uh, starting again at 38 minutes and 31 seconds. Yeah, keep looking for that. Do that for me, um, and I'll be right back. Okay. Thank you. Where are her house keys? Where they in her? Thank you. 
So she doesn't have house keys at all? I'm sure she does. Sergeant Hollis, uh, from about 43 minutes and 30 seconds here on the video, I, I stopped at about 43.25. Um, do you go back to your cruiser at that point? Yes, sir. Uh, and is that where you're uh, getting additional information, giving out information? Correct, yes, sir. Checking hospitals and things of that nature. Also, the guys that were searching the trail, I wanted to make contact with them and see if they were able to locate Emily at all. Uh, during this time period, where is your cruiser located? Um, it, in front of Mr. Moore's home. Okay. Other than you being in front of the home and Mr. Moore being in the house, were other people coming and going inside the house? No, sir. Okay, so just the two of you were there? Yes, sir. All right, uh, I'm going to fast forward to about 115.09. And is this when you walk back up to the uh, residence to talk to Mr. Moore again? It looks like that, yes, sir. <clears throat> All right. So we found a little bit of information. We still don't know where she is yet, okay? Your neighbor saw her in the garage about between 9 and 10 a.m. this morning. Said she was just standing in the garage. When he was leaving, he saw her. She was just standing there. He said hello. She said hello. This morning? This morning. Yeah, in the morning. Yeah, around 9, 10 o'clock. Awesome. He went about his business. Yes. Uh, 51. Okay. Um, so we know... Somewhere around. Okay. So, my question to you is do you, are we. Sergeant Hollis stopping at about 1 hour 15 minutes and 49 seconds. Up to this point, what was Mr. Moore saying in terms of when he believed Emily disappeared? Um, sometime before he got up at 10 a.m. Okay. Um, so, the information you just gave him was that new information or was that different information no sir it was it wasn't new information at all okay so based on his initial statement to you the information you just gave him didn't change anything correct had contact with her not too long ago the date escapes me i'm sorry um where she was very intoxicated in the middle of the state of state street we had contact with her within the last two years, okay. where she was very intoxicated in the middle of State Street. Or, State yeah, State Street. Street. Where we picked her up and brought her here. Okay. Um, where, do you know the name of Timothy Durbin? That you don't know that name? Well, he said he would take care of her, okay? Make sure nothing else happened. So we're sending cars to his address to see if she's there. Timothy Durbin, he lives in Genoa, not too far from here. How long ago was this? This was a few years ago. Yeah, was probably long ago. yeah it, this wasn't recent. I want to say it was either 17 or 19. I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So. And Sergeant Hollis, or was it later determined that incident you were just describing was on July 1st of 2017? Correct. Yes, sir. Uh, starting again here at 1 hour, 16 minutes, and 55 seconds. We, so what we're doing now, we know we started this morning, now we're checking this address up here. Um, and we also are going to Boyer Park. Yes. Okay, Boyer Park. All right, so we're checking that avenue as well. So that's what I was in my car working on. I believe she told us. Um, Celeste. I believe she, she gave us that information. So we looked it up and go, okay, that's, a, that's some place we need to go check. I understand. I know that's hard for you, but. But it's really great that it was 10.30 this morning. I mean, uh, between 9 and 10. It was all night in school. She yeah. Out, she was sober. Yeah. She wasn't like, you know, I'm sure if she's, I'm sure if she's around. Okay. She has to be. Okay. So, yeah, she's not, she's not in any did hospital. Her, did he see her read? No, he just said he left. She was standing in the garage with the door open. Yeah, she's always gardening. So okay, so. Yeah, between, between 9 and 10. And she left. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, does that sound like a new news sort of kind? I mean, what can happen to someone at 10, 10 o'clock in Westerville? 
That part I don't know. And the part that, that, that we try to figure out is there are two things we try to figure out when someone's reported missing. Did they do it on purpose or did someone take them? And that's what we, we always try to do on the purpose kids. Uh, that someone took her? Very, very low. Um, very low. But like, like I said, you know your wife. We don't know her. If, if I don't know if she was deep in thought. I don't know if she was upset about something. But you understand something doesn't make sense if she is squared away like I see her to be. And she leaves without her phone, her keys, her ID, you know, money. You know, she just, I'm done. I'm going to walk off. But not at 10 in the morning. Yeah. Right. And I'm Celeste tells us, she, she said, you're the love of her life. You know, you guys, yeah, have a very good relationship. Um, so, yeah, let us do some more digging um, and, and see what we can do, okay? I'll stay here. I'll just stay here. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'll be out here in the front of your, front of your house for a little bit. Um, oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely get give me that before I leave and then I'll go over the options of what my report's going to say um, and things of, of that nature but I'm still waiting to hear back from Genoa from up there. If he's a friend he may, maybe she's not with him but maybe she know he knows where she may be. You know what I mean? So, well, I'll definitely, uh, if I hear anything, I'll let you know. Okay. Here, Sergeant Howells, at uh, one hour, twenty minutes, and eleven seconds on the video. Uh, do you again return to your cruiser? Yes, sir. And uh, what are you doing during that time for period? I'm making contact with Genoa Township to see if they made contact with um, Mr. Durbin, I believe his name was, um, and he said he had not seen or heard from Emily. Okay. Are you also documenting and uh, catching up on information as well? Yes, sir. Um, um, adding her to the call as well as Mr. Moore, um, seeing any more contacts we may have had with either one of them. Um, and at that point, I had units going out to Boyer Park, which is uh, it's a large area, so they were out searching that, that part right there. Uh, so, again, is your cruiser located in the same place you testified to earlier? Yes, sir. It hasn't moved. Okay. Other than yourself and Mr. Moore, are there other people coming and going inside the house? No, sir. Okay, just the two of you again? Yes, sir. Uh, going forward to 207, uh, roughly 42. she likes to go to? Yeah, she's got, not without her car. Not without she, her car, she, okay. She walks, she, yeah, she goes to like, uh, if there's a, a path or a, a place to walk, mm -hmm. she's walking. She's all the time, like I have a, I've only been here for a couple years, 
National. Okay. Of Where are you from? Las Vegas. Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And I, know, I also noticed, are you guys legally married? Okay. I just know the last names were different. Just sorry. No, that's okay. I, just, I was just curious. Um, you did ask about the card, and I wanted to give that to you before I forgot. Um, that's all my information on the front. That's the report number on the back. Okay, so right now what I'm going to do is get with radio, and we're going to send out a, we have a large day law enforcement database, and I'm trying to make this as easy to understand as possible. This law enforcement database goes to every police department in the state of Ohio. I'm going to attach a note to her OL says, hey, if you come in contact with this person, we need to make contact with her. So Get with us. Oh, we have all, we have everything. We have, yes, sir, we have everything. Um, so that's the next step, and as well as the report. Um, you just keep doing what you've been doing. I'm trying to get in touch with as many people as possible. So, you know, yeah, because at, at this point now, you, you got to call as many people because now, now we're at the point, it just doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Now, for someone to be gone that long, how about seven years? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Most people, it's, it's really weird, most people will disappear or disappear. Do the same thing, leave all their stuff, and they just need a break. They just go somewhere. You, you don't hear from them for a few days, and then we'll get information. Hey, you know, I just needed a break. Um, you know, it is more common. What do they do? They just like walk somewhere. Well, so most of the time they drive. You know, most of the time they they they, they get in a car and they just go. Um, but yeah, it's uh. Honest to goodness, it's not uncommon for people to do that. So if you guys went out and had a wonderful time, you know, sounds like you guys are happily married, you didn't notice anything out of the ordinary with their moods or anything like that, I, I, I don't have any more information. You know, I mean, if only the information we're going to get is going to come strictly from you now. So we can check. I, just, I don't want to screw things up. What do you mean? Really bad time and dates, and I'm just not good at that shit. I just don't want to like give you wrong information. You know, I don't, it doesn't sound like you could. No, it's like, I screw things up a lot. No, you know we were with her yesterday. We just don't know if she left last night or this morning. That's the only thing we don't know. You know, we don't know how much of a head start she has. But is there all the bikes in there? Did she take a bike? The bikes are Okay, all the bikes are there? Okay. It's literally like bikes are And it's just not really. Or someone came and picked her up. Someone came and picked her up and you think it would be on. That's what I was going to say. Uh, I'm not into it. I don't know if you do that. I mean, I'm, I'm, so much shit's running through my head right now. Right. Let me, let me show you one thing. Okay. Just because I'm crazy. No, show me. This thing here. Did Mr. Moore just say this didn't belong here? Correct, yes, sir. Okay, and then he's identifying an area in the back of the garage? Yes. And that's the area we can see on your body camera here? Yes, sir. May I approach you? Uh, Sergeant Hollis, uh, just going to have you now look at what's been labeled State's Exhibit 8. Can you take a moment to look at that? Does that appear to be a screenshot of what we have on the screen here? It uh, is. Okay, and on your body cam, that would show 001854? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, both those screenshots we've talked about, they appear to be true and accurate based on your body camera? Yes, sir. And you've already said that your body camera is true and accurate based on your review and your recollection, correct? correct. Yes, sir. Starting here at 2 hours, 13 minutes, and 19 seconds. 
two hours, 14 minutes, and 35 seconds. Uh, these time periods we're talking about, again, is anybody else coming and going from the house? No, sir. No one at all. Just yourself and Mr. Moore? Correct. Starting again? Oh, You know what I mean? I don't know why I was waiting no. for that, man. It's okay. It's all right. Okay. All right. I, I'm talking to the police right now. Sorry. All right. Which is that? Have you noticed anything else missing? No. I mean, out of place? No. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, everything is so in place. Right. Now. Well, why would that be there? Okay. Someone did that. I didn't do it. Two hours, 16 minutes, and 14 seconds. Uh, what was the defendant's response to asking him whether all that had been there and been like that? He said yes. Okay. And did he describe you earlier if he had moved anything around? No, he did not. Okay. Uh, and the only thing he identified to you at this point was that orange extension cord? Yes, sir. This is not Right, but this is, this is her lifestyle. This is her. Everything has a, has a place. Yes. She's that. These are the shoes she was wearing last night. You know, when y'all went out to celebrate her birthday? That's right. And, and for these not to be like this, to me, means that there were shoes here. You know what I mean? I'm, I know what you mean. I'm going out. I'm, I mean. No, you're making sense. You're making perfect sense. There were shoes probably here that she's wearing. And I'm guessing that there were sneakers like this. Those were definitely the shoes she wore last night. Why she left them out here last night? Walking around, she doesn't want to try stuff in. Usually she would take them and bring them somewhere and she wouldn't leave them there. It's very, very odd. And that is super odd. I don't want to like be something like that. I don't want She's in this. These are herbs. What kind of herbs? Like cooking herbs? Or? Yeah. Okay. You dry them. You, they're, they're, they're wild foragibles. They're called. Just they're, they're, they're weeds that they don't spray with yeah, yeah. And what you use, you just you dry them out and you use them as in soups. You make teas out of them. Oh, okay. And it's kind of like um, strange. I noticed her purse. What about credit cards? Yeah. Does she 
I noticed that the person you showed me didn't have credit, it just had her ID. So I'm, does she have credit cards with her? Then maybe if she's using them, we can call a credit card company and see. Not yet. She, she, um, Are there? I'd be guessing last night she just brought this. I think she she might have just brought this with her. Yeah, okay. Sure. Are there credit cards in there? Yeah. Just kidding. Oh, wait. What's that beeping noise? That's my phone. Oh, okay. See, now that I need that phone call, they're going to be like people working in the counter. Yeah, for sure. Those are only two. Yeah, and the ones that now, if they should carry more than just these, I can guess it. Okay. I think now, I think. And she never had. If she had somewhere to go, she just wouldn't, she wouldn't not take that. Right. Which side of the bed does she sleep on? Uh, if you, on the right. She always sleeps on the right. Another, another thing, if she would have made this bed, she would have fixed the pillows. The pillows aren't made. Aren't that she put a straight and pull them They're like this. <coughs> that, that to me means that we were in here, maybe sleeping just on top, or, or you know what I mean? And I just don't know. Just, it's not normal. Not normal. When she goes to make a bed, she fixes the pillows. Well, you said you were sleeping in a bed last night, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we were drinking, and I'm not as foggy, but... Um, I remember getting up when I had to go pee. Uh huh. And I looked right at the clock because so I always do the same thing. It's a good time to figure out like, how much more time I got to work. Right. And I, on my phone, I, what I do is I was sitting and I just flipped in my phone. Uh huh. And I made like three or three texts to friends in the middle of the night. So I was just in, in the other room between the times of like two in the morning and four in the morning. And I think I probably fell back to sleep by about five. And that's why I slept full of water. Look around, Does she take vitamins? Um, occasionally. I'm the vitamin guy. All right, there's a salt vitamin in there. Yeah, she's, she does occasionally take She's very into all of them. She's got me. Which, which, which one of these books was the last one she agreed? You pick them up and open them up for me?
check your email. Yeah, check your email. Is it would that be the same email on your computer? You only have one email address? No, I, 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 this one. And I just cleaned it too, so it would be good. Okay. There's nothing here. And I just cleaned it so it can go off. I've got seven in there. What am I looking for? I wonder if she sent you anything. The only one the only, the only she knows about it is the wife for a which is the email. Okay. You don't have any enemies or anything? Sister, sorry. She said she's going to call her friends for me because she's a friend, faith, Facebook friend. She's going to call her pretty much all of her girlfriends. So she's just going to start calling her. But I can't 
can't, she wouldn't allow, she wouldn't go somewhere and be like, this time I want to get away. And a friend's mom, or maybe a friend that doesn't know me very well, but they, I've been through so much because my, my son just died a lot. Yeah. And he went through it. Yeah. Why would it make me worry about this? She's right. Like, it's, just not, it's not her style. She's not like that. She knows how she would know how to work out. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go up to that park you just told me about, look around up there, and then get the report complete. If you hear anything, um, the neighbors are checking, they're talking to each other, um, and I'm going to do that, more or less put everything to leads as missing, so if any law enforcement comes in contact with her, um, they'll know where to look up for her. Um, and yeah, if you hear anything or anything like that, uh, give us a call, okay? Um, obviously, if I know, find anything out with somebody, I'll contact you or somebody will. Um, I just After you left uh, the residence, where did you head to? I went to the park uh, that he described to me behind Home Depot up north of Maxtown Road. 
Okay. Uh, during this time period before you left, were there other people coming and going, or was it just you and? It was just me and me and Mr. Moore. Okay. Um, other than what we've seen today, did you have other parts of your investigation? Did you interview any other individuals? I, I did. Um, I interviewed a bartender at Old Bag of Nails um, and made contact with her. I don't recall how long after this video had been taken. Okay. Uh, just one moment, Your Honor. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think we'll take it. Is it okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, let's take a ten-minute break, stretch, and restroom. Uh, remember the court's admonition. Back shortly.
Please have a seat. Thank you. <clears throat> Defense may begin. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Sergeant Hollis, Diane Benashi on behalf of Matt Moore. How are you? I'm well. And yourself? I'm good. Thank you. I want to go back through a number of things that you testified to, but let me start where we end with the body cam. I think that was about plus or minus in its entirety, about two and a half hours. Does that sound right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, there was two instances where you left the home, um, spoke with someone else, and then re-entered the home. Does that sound like what happened? Yes, ma'am. I want to be clear, and I know the jurors watched the video, but let's start at the end. When you left the house, I didn't hear you give any directive to Matt Moore that he needed to stay outside the home until further notice, right? No, ma'am. You never told him he couldn't leave the home, right? No, ma'am. You never told him he couldn't touch anything inside the home? No, ma'am. And I assume, it's sort of a dumb question, but I ask it anyway, that you're familiar with what crime scene tape is, right? Yes, ma'am. When you secure an area so that it's preserved in its complete and utter integrity, right? That's Co what crime scene tape does. Correct. You Blocks off that. anyone from accessing that area, so what is it? Correct. And in fact, I even remember at neither time when you went outside, did you ever tell Matt Moore, please step outside while I talk to this officer. You left him inside the house, did you not? I did, yes, ma'am. And when he told you that he had his weapon, you didn't ask him for his weapon, you just continued to talk to him? Correct. And uh, when he took you into Joey's bedroom, he went like this, right? Like, come on over here. And you walked into, into the second bedroom. Okay, yes ma'am. The second bedroom has its own bathroom, does it not? I, yes ma'am, up to the right. The, the state asked you about uh, the size of that house, eight or nine hundred square feet, plus or minus, you testified to? Yes ma'am. The living area is in between the two bedrooms, is it not? Yes, ma'am. And then there's an attic, uh, like a screened-in porch, sorry, that's closer to the front door. Correct. And there's an area where from the kitchen you walk past a washer and dryer into the garage. Okay, yes, ma'am. You were there. Do you remember that? I do. And then you were told by Mr. Moore that there was an attic. Yes, ma'am. Your training, I think, and I know you're a sergeant now, mm -hmm. um, but you're a patrol officer by training. Is that fair to say? Uh, Kurt, ask me again. Sure. I, when I was listening, oh, you're not a detective. Correct. You're not a homicide detective. Correct. Um, and I asked that because I was listening to your experience. You've been uh, an officer for how long again? Uh, over eight years. And before you were a sergeant, as of a month ago? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you were a patrol officer, right? Correct. A patrol officer is you get a dispatch from the police department and you respond to a dispatch. Correct. And that's what you did in this case? Yes, ma'am. Uh, is the body cam that you're wearing automatically triggered when you get out of the car? No, ma'am. So you actually turn it on? Correct. And you can also, isn't it true, turn it off? Yes, ma'am. The 911 call that you were played, it seemed as if, but tell me if I'm wrong, you'd never heard that call before today. Correct. So today was the first time that you had heard the 911 call. Correct. Let's talk about what you and Mr. Moore talk about when you get there. He immediately tells you, does he not, that her purse, ID, and car keys are at the house. Correct. He doesn't try to tell you actually she took all of her belongings. Um, he tells you it's odd and uses the word uncharacteristic for her to do this. Okay, yes. Is that right? Yes. You ask him about the night before 
and he tells you that they went to three bars. Do you remember him telling you that? Yes. And later, you followed up with respect to at least a whole bag of nails, and he was right about that, was he not? Yes, he was. That they had been there together. Correct. He said a number of times it was very unusual that she wasn't there at that time of day. Right? Correct. <clears throat> you asked him about the sleeping in another room. You walked into that second second bedroom, did you not? I did. And I remember on the tape, you kind of said to him, um, is this like your man cave? Correct. And he said, well, it's a little messy in here because uh, otherwise Emily's pretty, you know, very organized and tidy, but he it was said, messy. He there. said it was his room, yes. It was his room. Yes. And so you remember, I'm sure, because based on your eight years on the force, you're looking for any visual cues, right? Possibly, yes. You saw the pillows on yes. the couch? Yes. You saw the comforter, uh, the, the white bedding next to the couch? I don't recall white bedding next to the couch. Do you remember sheets? Uh, do you remember uh, a bed sheet being on a chair? No, ma'am. You don't? No. Give me one second and I'll... Do you remember um, tennis shoes being near the uh, couch? No, ma'am. So what you remember is pillows on a uh, pillows on the couch that was in the room. Correct. And you remember going back into the other bedroom, uh, where, where the bed was shown that was made. Do you remember walking into that bathroom? Yes. Do you remember that there was a hamper there that uh, had clothing in it? No. Ma Do you remember going into the second bedroom and there was a hamper there with clothing in it? No. Ma and when you say you don't remember. I would you agree that the only pictures that we have from the time that you were in the house was what's captured on your body cam? Correct. Because you weren't also taking pictures, right, right. of the nooks and crannies? Correct. Fair to say, though, two and a half hours you were there. Correct. If you had seen anything, broken glass, blood, hairs, anything that seemed remotely out of place, you would have either sealed the scene, had another officer come in, right? You would have preserved that <coughs> scene, would you not? Depending on what I believe took place in that home, yes ma'am. Sure, because, and I remember you saying on direct examination, and you remember you telling Mr. Moore, two scenarios here. Either someone voluntarily leaves or someone takes her. Yes, those were what you told Mr. Moore, right? Yes, yes ma'am. And you would agree with me that if those are the only two scenarios, one of them is not a crime and the other is. Correct. So you're in that house talking to Mr. Moore, not just getting, trying to get information, but you're also understanding the room. Right? You're getting, you're seeing any visual cues. Yes, ma'am. Remember that big glass cabinet that's there in the house? In between the kitchen and the bedroom? Yes, yep. No broken glass on that. No, ma'am. Uh, remember the kitchen, how there was dishes in the sink, or there's uh, dishes on the side there? Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you check the washer dryer? No, ma'am. The garage. Did you check the car to see if it was warm? No, ma'am. Did you check the Ultima to see if it was warm? No, ma'am. Because what you did in its entirety was captured on that body cam. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. The state in their direct examination paused and said, Officer, I want to make sure I heard that. What did he say about the bed? And you said that it was, it was her bed. Do you remember that? He corrected himself. He, he began to say her bed, then he said our bed. And would it surprise you to know that that house was Emily's house before Matt got there? Yes. Yeah. And so, if so, what's in the house is Emily's, right? Or Mr. Moore's as well, since he lives there. Sure. And so it was when the state asked him on direct if he said it was her bed or our bed. 
And then he also simultaneously, or rather later in the interview, said that that was his room, the second room. Did he not? Correct. I want to talk about all the things that Matt did. And have you ever, you're not a homicide detective, so you don't, by training, investigate homicides. Correct. So I want to just talk to you about all the things you asked Mr. Moore to do, my client to do, and he did so without, pop, without cause. You knocked, he opens the door, right? Correct. This is on May 25th. He's wearing shorts and a t-shirt, is he not? Correct. Glasses? Yes, ma'am. No, glasses aren't broken? No, ma'am. I would assume, Sergeant, that if you saw any scratches on his arms, forearms, hands, neck, legs, you would have made a note of that? If I would have noticed that, yes, ma'am. And he's wearing, he's not fully clothed when he opens that door to let you in his home, right? That's when he's wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I meant pants and a long sleeve shirt, sorry. Oh, correct. No, he, right? he wasn't. So you walk into the house, he lets you in the house, mm -hmm. does he not? Correct. Shows you, in fact, one at one point he's like, come on in here to the second bedroom, which is he calls his bedroom. Okay, yes ma'am. Right? Yes ma'am. Uh, takes you, you say, can I go see the car? And he says, let's go this way. And then he takes you into the garage. Correct. Does all of that. Right? Never yes. says you can't come in here. Correct. And you didn't have a warrant. Right. You're just responding to a call that he made reporting his wife missing. Correct. You ask for his wife's cell phone, he gives you the phone. I don't recall asking for his cell, her cell phone. Is her phone here and okay. he shows you her phone? Yes, ma'am. You ask where is her, her wallet and he gives the wallet, yes. right? And then you say, well, is that where the wallet was found? And he adds the information. No, actually, it was over here in the bedroom, right? Right. You ask about information as to where they were supposed to be going for the picnic, and he gives, he accesses the phone and gives you that information. Correct. He invites you back in after you leave and talk to one of your uh, colleagues outside, yes, right? Yes, ma'am. When you say, where are her keys? He opens the door to the car, leans in and gets the keys and gives you the keys. I don't recall asking for the car keys. I'm sorry, you said, where are her keys? And he said, she keeps them in the car. Do you remember seeing him that in the video? No, I remember asking for his, her house keys inside the apartment. I didn't ask where her car keys were. Okay, do you remember when we watched how he opens the door and he leans yes, in and the car keys? Yes, I do remember that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right, and, and did you, did, when you were at the scene, the Subaru, you, it's your understanding, it was her car and the car outside was his car. Correct. And then he starts to tell you early on that she walks and she forages, right? That yes. she would go on walks. Yes, ma'am. He specifically tells you where she likes to walk. Does he not? Yes, ma'am. Right away, on May 25th, as soon as you get to the house. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And you're obviously familiar with this area. Uh, showing you what's been marked as, one second. That is exhibit D. Sergeant Hall, do you recognize this, uh, this area as pictured in this map? Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to put the sticker here. It's going to have to cover a, a, a small bit of that corner. But uh, what are we looking at here in this map? Uh, an aerial view of uh, Main Street County Line, State Street, um, and the address, or I mean the street name of where Mr. Moore lived. And um, if you could, and, and sir, you can mark on your screen as well. Uh, can you mark where, uh, just approximately where 46 Abbey Cross Lane is, based on your dispatch to that location? Uh, 
in, in approximate uh, in this area here, I believe. And uh, thank you, sir. And on the opposing side of the street, so over there, yes, where my indication is, would you agree with me that that is where John Kramer lived? Uh, yes, ma'am, his neighbor. And remember uh, in the video, so we're talking May 25th. I think you got there at it's the exact arrival time. Do you remember that, Sergeant? Um, I'll, no, ma'am, I don't. Sound, sound uh, six-ish at, at night? I think a little bit before six, yes, ma'am. Before six, and then we know from the body cam that you were there at, at around two and a half hours. Yes, ma'am. Does that sound right? Yes, ma'am. So in that time frame, we know from the body cam that you learn, you and or your fellow officers, learn that John Kramer, directly across the street, saw Emily in the driveway, the garage door open between 9 and 10 a.m. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. And in fact, uh, there wasn't any uncertainty about the time because at one point Mr. Moore says, oh, so she was seen at 10.30, and you said, no, no, Mr. Kramer said between 9 and 10. Correct. That's the, that's the day that morning of, right? Your, Mr. That information you're giving Matt is that she was seen between 9 and 10 a.m. that morning. Correct. And given your uh, understanding of that scene, would you agree with me that 51 Abbey Cross is literally directly across from 46? Uh, almost. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Maybe a few feet, right? Correct. But it's, it's not Caddy Corner. They're, Correct. Yes, ma'am. They're, they're right across there. And then I want to just talk a little bit about county line, if we could. Based on your uh, experience and familiarity with um, Delaware County, how would you describe that road? Um, it runs east and west. Um, it's a, well, four lane road total. Heavily trafficked road, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Uh, two lanes each way? Uh, yes, ma'am. There is no shoulder where you can pull a car over uh, near that wooded area. Correct. You agree? There's no shoulder here. Right. Now, I want to go back to, to my original question about Mr. Moore. Right when you uh, are, are interviewing him, I don't know if it's 20 minutes in, but it's fairly soon, when he tells you, does he not, about the area that Emily loves to walk. Yes. And do you remember during that uh, time when he's telling you about that, voluntarily so, Celeste is standing right there? Yes. He says, do, does he not, it's the area right by the bridge, the walkway. Yes. And he tells you that there's the bike path there. Yes, ma'am. He tells you there's the sidewalk there. Correct. And he tells you that it's the woods in between that area where she loves to go down and forage. Correct. The area is that area right there, is it not? Yes, ma'am. And then you heard, because it was told directly to you and captured on the body cam, that at some point within that two and a half hours, Celeste goes to that area and looks for Emily. I believe so, yes. And she's found nothing. I, I'm... She finds nothing there. She, on the body cam, she says, I went and looked and I didn't see anything. I don't remember her saying that. Okay. Do you remember her saying on the body cam that she went and looked at the area? I do, or I don't recall if she said she was going to go look okay. at that point, or she had already looked, but I do remember her referring to that area. Okay. And I remember during your direct examination, the state stopped and said, uh, Mr. Moore, did he tell you that he had been to that area? that he had searched that area, and Sergeant, you said no, he had not. Correct. But he told you right where the area was, yes. right? Yes. He asked you when he's at the vehicle, the vehicle uh, being the Subaru, but I heard him, and, and tell me if, uh, I'm wrong. He said you want to check the trunk. Yes, ma'am. 
And I have, uh, after 2636, um, Celeste walks up and says that she searched the park, but you don't have any independent recollection of that. I do not. You asked Mr. Moore if uh, Emily was on any medicine and whether you could go into the bathroom and look for medicine bottles, and he says you can? I never asked to go to look inside the bathroom for medicine bottles. Did you, did you tell me what you said when you said, can you show me? Yes. Okay. Uh, words are everything. Fair enough. Um, he said, you asked, does she take any medication? And he says, yes, she does sometimes. Correct. And you say, can you show me? Correct. And he says yes and that's proceeds it, to take it. Because I would like to know the name of the, the medication. Sure. And he gave, me the, gave you the name of that medication? Correct. And then something else he did was when you were asking him about what they did the day before, he's very specific about they go to Butel, they get the water, the spring water, right? Yes, ma'am. He even takes you to his phone and shows you exactly where they went, Franklin Street and Marietta. Do you remember those details? Yes, ma'am. And do you know now, in fact, that uh, that, that was accurate information? Uh, yes, ma'am. That was accurate? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you remember, because it wasn't captured on film, I just want to make sure, I can play it if, if we need to, so let me know, but on the dining room table there, there was like a white sheet and there was actually things that had been foraged on the dining room table. Do you remember that? No, ma'am. You don't? You don't remember that anything was drying on the dining room table? No, ma'am. Not okay. on the dining room table. Okay. But, cer <coughs> but certainly, just like the state did, we could screenshot that. and, and Whatever is captured by your body cam is captured by your body cam, correct? Yes, yes ma'am. And then on your direct examination, the state paused the video again when at 3831, and, and of course, um, I, I wrote down that Mr. Moore says for the first time, the word suicide. And on direct examination, you were asked, did Mr. Moore just say suicide? And you said, yes, that's the first time he mentioned it. And you were asked, well, had you asked him about it? Do you remember that line of questioning, Sergeant? No, ma'am. Okay, Let, I, I just want to be clear that you asked Matt Moore very early on about the option of suicide. Yes, Would she, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. And as you learn from your time there, his son had committed suicide. Correct. I, and, and I'm, you're, in your training and expertise, have you ever responded to a suicide? Many times. Okay. Uh, even many times, still traumatic? Yes, ma'am. And uh, assume from your experience and training that a parent that loses their child by suicide could be a traumatic event. Correct. Right? Yes, ma'am. And then someone goes missing, the same person that ex has experienced their child kill themselves. That could be a traumatic experience. Yes, yes ma'am. And as part of your training, right, as an officer, is to uh, not necessarily be empathetic, but mm -hmm. to understand, right, how to process facts and circumstances. Correct. And so you're at the scene and you realize that a man that's called and reported his wife missing had a child go missing and kill himself not too long before. Yes, ma'am. There's no alarm in the house, you learned? Correct. And then the incident, I want to talk about the uh, incident on the video that uh, you share with Mr. Moore. <clears throat> As part of sort of the workup that's being done while you're out the house is you run a report on Emily Noble, or one of your officers does. It is not a report, no ma'am. Uh, run a search history? Uh, yes ma'am, we'll never put the name in the search history pops up. Type her name in because you want to see if there's any history, right, with Emily and perhaps your department or anything else. Yes ma'am. Um, and, and would you agree with me that that's something you might do because let's say uh, someone had picked up a woman an hour prior without identification on, right? And she described herself as Emily Noble. That could be possible. And you run it, or someone does, and it pops up that she had this incident in July 1st. Mm -hmm. 
of 2017, where she's found so intoxicated that she's walking the state street. Is that right? Correct. And she has to be taken home by the police uh, where a man agrees to watch over her. Correct. And that man is not Matt Moore. Correct. You, his name was Tim? I don't remember. I think his last name was Durbin. Yes, ma'am. Tim Durbin, perhaps, but you remember the last name as being Durbin. I believe, yes, ma'am. And there was, was there not, an actual run report and a police report that describes that situation that happened on July 1st, 2017 with Emily? I would assume so, yes, ma'am. to Matt that her friends had been reached out and they described Matt as the love of Emily's life. According to Celeste, yes sir. Yes ma'am. According to Celeste. Yes ma'am. Boyer Park, I just want to make sure that uh, the jurors um, know that that location plus or minus about a mile or a mile and a half from Abbey Cross, does that sound right? I would say more than that. Okay. Yes ma'am. What would you say? Um, I would say maybe four miles from from that. Okay, fair enough. Well, have you ever driven or uh, mapped that distance? No, ma'am. Boyer Park, uh, based on your experience as an officer in Delaware, is a uh, wooded area? Correct. There's a running trail there or a walking trail? Yes, ma'am. And it's Boyer Park where uh, Matt's son hung himself? Correct. And that's why that area was searched? Yes, ma'am. Matt at some point says, what do you, towards the end, what do you want me to keep, what do you want me to keep doing? And you indicate, do you not, keep doing what you're doing? Yes, ma'am. And he says, keep me in the loop. Yes, ma'am. One moment, Your Honor. want him to do, and you said keep doing what you're doing, it, as I heard it, tell me if I'm wrong, he says, do you want me to get on her Facebook? Do you remember that? No, ma'am. You don't. And you don't remember then telling him yes? I, I, in regards to her Facebook, I remember asking him to get on her Facebook to get phone numbers for the cookout that they were supposed to be going to. And obviously body cam speaks for itself, right? Yes, ma'am. As to what was said and done. Nothing further. Rita? No, no further questions on behalf of the state, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, uh, you may write them down and provide it to our court reporter. Anybody have any questions? We have one question at least coming? Okay.
Sergeant, uh, I have a couple questions for you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the first question is, did the defendant, Mr. Moore, have access to Emmy, Emily Noble's Facebook on his own phone, if you know? I do not know. All right. And the second question is, uh, did you look at the uh, defendant, Mr. Moore's car? Um, I did look at the car. I did not look inside the car. Okay, you just outside only? Yeah, yes, sir. All right. No questions, John. Okay. Defense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You may step down. Certainly. I do. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I've talked to you before, so I know this. I'm going to ask you to speak close to the microphone and make sure everyone can hear you, Celeste, okay? Okay. And can you tell uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury your name? Celeste Grown. And could you spell your last name for the record? G R O N E. And Celeste, how old are you? 57. And what town do you live in? Westerville, Ohio. How long have you lived there? Uh, 22 years. And uh, what's your occupation? Uh, I'm a system engineer. And Celeste, do you know someone by the name of Emily Noble? Yes. And uh, how did you first meet Emily Noble? I met her at the pool of crossings of Windermere. And what is the crossings of Windermere? It is a condo development in Westerville. And oh, do you know what county that's located in? Delaware County. Now, did you live there, or how is it that you came to meet Emily Noble there? Uh, I owned a condo there that my dad lived in. And so you owned the condo in the crossings of Windermere, but your dad lived there? Yes. And you met Emily Noble at the pool in that neighborhood? Yes. Uh, were you going to the pool? Yes. And about what year was that, if you remember? It was the summer of 2017. And um, did Emily live in that neighborhood? Yes. Do you know where she lived? 46 Abbey Cross Lane. And so you're at the pool in 2017, and how is it that you came in to contact with Emily Noble? Emily was at the pool, and I was at the pool, and she introduced herself, and we became friends. And so when you first met her then at the pool, kind of instant friendship? Yes. And uh, did your friendship continue to grow from that point? Yes. And uh, what, as friends, would you like to do? We would like to go out to eat. We would like to sit in her condo and maybe uh, share a drink. Um, we went to Belize on vacation together. Did you call each other on the phone? 
Uh, once or twice. How did you primarily communicate as friends, though? Text messages. And in the summer, I assume you would hang out at the pool? Yes. Now, as your friendship is growing in 2017, and you mentioned a trip to Belize, which we'll get to in a moment, how often is it that you would spend time with Emily, text with Emily? What was your friendship like? Uh, we would te text at least once a week, and we would get together about once a month. And that could be at her condo or at a restaurant? Yes. Now, when you first met Emily in 2017, did you know her to be married? No. And she was living in that condo alone? Yes. Now, at some point, though, uh, did you know Emily Noble to get married? Yes. And do you remember when that was? August of 2018. And do you know who she married? Uh, Matthew Moore. And do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes. <laughs> he's wearing a gray shirt. Any more? Uh, he has glasses on his head. Can you point him out? He's over <laughs> in the corner there. <laughs> And how is it that you learned Emily and Matt got married? Uh, Emily called me. And did she invite you to the wedding or what? No. Had the wedding already taken place? Yes. Do you know uh, how close in time Emily and the defendant were married uh, to when you found out? It was a couple of days later. Did you know about Matt, though, before Emily and Matt got married? Yes. And you knew that they were dating? Yes. Did you know that he had moved into the condo? Yes. So it's not like it was a huge surprise that they got married? No. Now, after they were uh, married, did you still see Emily? Yes. And your friendship, did it change? No. Uh, and when you would go over to the condo, was Matt there? Yes. Now, at some point after Emily and Matt were married, did someone else move into the condo with them? Yes. And who was that? Joey Moore, uh, Matt Moore's son. Same questions again. Same, same friendship with Emily, right? Right. You go over to the condo? Yes. And. Uh, Still text message? Yes. Still hang out at the pool? Yes. Did you get to observe Emily quite a bit through your friendship? Yes. Um, different interactions, and you got to observe her with Matt? Yes. You got to observe her with Joey, you got to observe her in the condo? Yes. And. You mentioned already one time traveling to Belize. Do you yeah. remember that? When was that? Uh, that was May 17th, 2019 to May 24th, 2019. I just went on vacation last month. I don't remember the date. How is it that you remember those dates? May 17th is my birthday and May 24th is Emily's. We chose those dates specifically. And so who went with you to Belize? Just Emily. And so it was a birthday girls trip? It was. Now was there a moment on that trip where you observed Emily uh, to be upset? Yes. And did you know uh, why she was upset? Yes. And why? It was her birthday on May 24th and Matt texted her in the morning, hey space girl, instead of happy birthday. And she was upset? She was very upset.
Now, when you returned from Belize, did you and Emily stay in contact? Yes. The same kind of friendship. Texts? Yes. You would see her occasionally? Yes. Out to dinner? Yes. Maybe at a condo? Yes. Uh, but then there was a tragedy a few months later? Yes. And what was it? Um, Matt's son, Joey, committed suicide. How did you find out? A couple days after it happened, Emily called me and told me. Um, and what did you do in response? I asked her if there was anything that I could do for her, any meals, anything. And what did you do? Um, she wanted beer that night, <laughs> so I brought beer over, and during the week I brought meals over a couple of times. And uh, fair to say it was a devastating time. It was very devastating. And uh, if you know, what were some things that Emily were do was doing during that time? Did she continue to work? She did not. And what happened? She took um, FMLA from work because she was afraid that Matt would commit suicide. Very concerned about Matt? Yes. If you know, did Emily seek uh, help herself? She did. And how? She um, went to, uh, I believe it was a licensed social worker for therapy. Now, uh, to your knowledge, if you know, did Emily return to work? Yes. And uh, do you remember what that return to work was like? She had many supportive um, co-workers that she didn't realize were there. And so timeline-wise, are we kind of at the end of 2019? We are. So now let's, let's talk about the first couple months of 2020. Friendship <coughs> remains the same with Emily? Yes. <clears throat> and then COVID happens, right? Right. Did you continue to communicate with Emily uh, during COVID? Yes. And so that would have been in about March 2020? Uh, March 2020, yes. And how, what was your primary form of communication then? Text. And what about then in April of 2020? Continue to text? Yes. And uh, would your texting increase during that time or about to stay the same? Um, about the same. Did you do what some of those people like to refer to as friend checks? Yes. And what's a friend check? We check on each other every week or every few days to make sure each of us is okay. And that's because we were in lockdown. Right. Uh, now, there came a time, though, when you and Emily made plans to see each other, right? Right. And this was the first time you'd seen her since March? Since Your Honor's ongoing meeting. I'm sorry? The ongoing meeting is direct. Refresh. When was the first time you made plans to see Emily? It was um, May 22nd, 2020. <laughs> When was the last time you saw Emily before May 22nd of 2020? March 12th of 2020. How did you feel about your May 22nd plans? Um, I was very happy to be meeting up with her. And did you meet up with her on May 22nd? We met up about 6 p.m on May 22nd at Emily's condo. What was the reunion like? Oh, it was very fun. We, um, she was drinking uh, a seltzer, a hard seltzer, and I had a bottle of wine. Um, and we were in the condo. Um, we took a walk around the neighborhood and um, 
we foraged for plants. And when you were at her condo, was anyone else there? Matt was there. And you got to see him? Yes. And what was Emily's demeanor while you guys were together? She was very happy while we were together. Now you indicated that you went on a walk through the neighborhood and you foraged. Yes. What does forage mean to you? Uh, we um, picked and ate edible plants. She had a huge book with plant species and she knew which ones were edible and which ones were poisonous. Had you ever foraged before with Emily? No. And uh, does it appear to be a aerial map view of the Abbey Cross County Line Road area? Yes. Now, can you tell from this map uh, where about Emily lived? Yes. And go ahead and mark the screen, please. In that area. All right. Now, when you're spending time at the condo, you said you went for a walk. Yes. Can you, can you use your finger and drag the path you took to go on a walk? And you can narrate why, while you do it. Okay, we went here. We actually... We're going to need you to speak up into the microphone. There you go. I'm going to move it. Okay, so we actually stopped at the pool, and I... Um, we went over here by the pool, and I went in the pool, and a lady named Sue Fernstermaker was there, um, and I asked her um, if the pool was open, and she indicated it was open, but only for residents. Since I didn't live there, um, I was angry. So Emily and I, we, we went back. Let me just stop you right there. Uh-huh. The pool has some drama in the neighborhood between residents and owners using it, right? Right. And so that's why you were upset when that was the response you got from the individual Your Honor, there. Meeting? Objection. Your Honor, I'm just trying to clarify what she said. I'll, I'll permit this background info. Okay. Okay, so yeah. you, now let's move on. From the pool area, where do you and Emily walk? We walked here. And back here on Ashbrook, and back around here. And if you'll notice, there's a little court, and there's an entryway into uh, the, the path. So we walked here, and um, we stopped at, I'm going to go back, we stopped at this house. Emily's very friendly, so she stopped and talked to these neighbors that she didn't know. Um, Did you know them? No. Uh, they were doing some work in their yard and they were sitting out. So we had a conversation with them, or, or at least she did, and then we walked back here and we did some foraging right around over here and back here. There's actually this wall here and there's a lot of plants in here that are edible. So I'm going to stop you right there. Okay. So when you're talking about foraging on this path, and you've kind of marked over it, but where the arrow is, is that the bike path? It, it is the bike path, but we went, we went off the All right, bike. so let me ask a question. Okay. So from the bike path to the woods, is there a grassy area? Yes. And is that what you were walking along? Yes. All right. And where would you forage from that grassy area? Um, on either side. So there's, again, the wall here where um, the path actually goes up because it goes across county line. And then on the other side where there's, um, there's this little forest here. So we went and um, 
uh, for, um, found plants over here. And so the foraging on the wall, I'm assuming that's just something you can see right there and pick it. Right. Now, when you're foraging along the wood side, do you physically go into the woods? Uh, no, we just picked, they were, they were kind of sticking out, maybe just a tad bit in, but the plants were on the edge. So you were foraging along the edge? Yes. And was that what you knew Emily to do? Yes. So you are coming down that edge then, and where do you and Emily go next? Uh, uh, we continued walking, and we walked here, and then we went back, and we went to her condo. All right, so when you're walking down county line then, are you on a sidewalk, a grassy area, or in the woods? Uh, there's a sidewalk, we were on the sidewalk on the county line road. And would you forage along that wood side? No. You were just walking on the sidewalk? It, right, there's nothing to forage there. Uh, but there are woods there? Yes. All right. And, but you didn't forage with Emily along that side? No. So the only foraging you did was by the bike path and the wood line by the bike path? Right. So from that, then you go back to the condo. Right. And what was this date again? It was Friday, May 22nd. Six till probably eleven PM ish. Was Friday, May twenty second, twenty twenty, the last time you ever saw Emily alive? Yes. Now, did you have any more communications with Emily the next day? Yes. What were those communications? Um, she texted me to see if I was still alive after eating the foraging plants. <laughs> and you were, right? I, I texted her back, I am alive. <laughs> I forgot to ask you this. You talked about that big book she carries. Right. Did she take that with you on your walk? No. Okay. Now, after that communication from her to make sure you were still alive, did you communicate again with Emily? Yes. Sunday was her birthday, and I um, texted her a happy birthday um, a little after 6 uh, in the evening. So that was on Sunday, May 24th, 2020. Right. And did you get a response? Yes. What was it? It was emojis. <laughs> emojis. Did you receive any more communications from Emily? No. Now I want to turn to May 25th. Did you receive a phone call in the evening from Emily's phone? Yes. Do you recall what time that was? That was 5.47 p.m. No. Who was it? It was Matt. And tell the jury what the defendant said. Um, Matt um, called and asked if Emily was at my house. And I said, no, she's not here. Um, what else did he say then? Okay. He um, said that um, she, 
he thought she left in the morning and went for a walk and hadn't came back and they were supposed to go to a party but she hadn't came home yet um, so I asked him if this was normal behavior and he said no so I said call the police and he said don't I have to wait 24 hours and I said, no, not if this isn't normal behavior, call the police. And then what did he say? Um, then he said he, he, would, um, he would call the police and I'll, I'll see you in a little bit, um, meaning that I would come over to the condo at that time. Uh, so we hung up and I packed up and headed over. Uh, two and a half miles. So it didn't take you very long to get there, right? No. And who was there when you got there? So I arrived, my car, his um, G GPS satellite enabled, so my clock said 6.06 .06 p.m. and the police were um, out uh, at the condo with Matt when I arrived. And you stayed at the condo for a little bit, right? Right. Uh, but then did you go out uh, that same path you went on Friday, May 22nd? I, I did. I couldn't do anything because Matt was in the house with the police. Uh, so I asked the police if it was okay to go search and they said yes. So I drove to, I drove my car to the same place um, that we had walked in with the little court. Um, All right, so let me stop you there. Okay. You drove and you parked this time to where the court was. Right. right. And you get out. I got out. Which way do you travel? I travel the same way that em Emily and I went um, because I was retracing our paths, thinking that maybe she might be hurt and fell foraging. Right. So you're walking towards county line. I am, I walk the bike trail and walk toward county line. And then where did you go? Um, then I went down county line road. Did you go into the woods at that time? No. Then did you return to the condo? Um, I continued walking down, then I turned around and retraced the back steps. Um, back I was to your car? Back to my car um, and got in my car and went back to the condo. Now, after that evening, to say there were numerous searches for Emily Your Honor, you're leaving? I'm just trying to join you, Your Honor. Well, I just ask you if there were numerous searches. Were there yeah. numerous searches there for Emily There were numerous searches for Emily. And how many did you participate in, roughly? Um, the, mostly um, on my, my own, only one of the organized, but at least five, and many just on my own beyond that. Would you search with other people? Yes. Would you ask people to join you? Yes. Uh, did you ask the defendant to join you? Yes. Did the defendant ever go with you on these searches? No. for you, if I can, um, I want to go back to what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit D. Uh, and again, I know the jury's becoming quite familiar with it, but uh, fair to say, 
Celeste, 46 Abbey Crosses, thereabouts, where I just put that red X? Uh, yes. And you, you talked about the route you took. It, it's, it was cleared from the screen, so I, I just want to go back to it. Does that look familiar, Celeste? Yes. Is the route? And, yes. and when you indicated that uh, you walked down, there was a grassy area uh, as you walked in this area, was there not? Yes. Where you're no longer on a sidewalk, you're actually kind of on this sloped grass. Yes. And uh, when on the 25th, when the officer was with Matt at the house, you retraced this entire route. Yes. Including, uh, you walked down along this edge and then you walked the sidewalk right there as well. No. I'm, so you didn't walk county line? I walked county line, but I didn't go, I, I just turned around because my car was back in that court area. So. I just walked to the edge of the forest and then walked back and got into my car that ah. was over there. And so you didn't have to go all the way back to it? Um, no, I had to get my car. Um, and do you remember being at the house when uh, Hollis, Officer Hollis was asking uh, Matt questions right when he first arrived at the scene? Yes. And um, by the time you got to 46 Abbey Cross, the police were already there. Yes. So common sense and it tells you when you pull up between your conversation with Matt Moore and you arriving at the house in that short period of time, the police had already gotten there. Yes. So fair to say you assumed that after your conversation, Matt did in fact call the police. Yes. Do you remember when you walked around the corner when the officer was standing there with Matt and he saw you for a second and he seemed startled? Do you remember that? Matt? Yeah. Yes. And he said, oh my gosh, because you look, you look like Emily. Yes. And you do look like Emily a bit, don't you? Yes. And that was right when Officer Hollis got there. He, he thought he saw you, he thought you were Emily. Yes. I want to, just a few questions about your friendship with Emily. I, I know uh, we had the opportunity to watch the video, Officer Hollis's, when you were standing there uh, with Matt and the officer, and um, Emily, and, and you were very good friends. Yes. And the prosecutor asked you on direct about that friendship started uh, 2017? Yes. During the course of that time, in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, if you had any information, Celeste, that Emily was in danger, or was a victim of some kind of violence, you certainly would have done something about that. Yes. And in fact, as you told the officers, you believe that Emily and Matt had a, had a good marriage. Yes. And when you were over at the house, the last time you saw Emily on May 22nd of 2020, Matt was there? Yes. And it was fun. It was a fun night. As far as I know. Yeah. <laughs> At the 22nd when you were there, right, at, at the house with Emily and Matt, you had a good time. I had a good time. Yes. And you indicated to the jury that she was drinking, I think you said some kind of cider ale. Do you remember that? It was um, a spiked, spiked seltzer. Did she, uh, did you know her to drink those Rheingeist bubbles in the pink cans? They were green. Green? Do you remember what kind it was? No. During your friendship with Emily, um, how many times in 17, 18, 19, and 20 did you, um, were you with Emily or did you see her sister with her? A couple times. 
Do you remember the last time that you saw um, her sister? Um, the last time I saw her sister that I remember was at Coble. Right. Was at a restaurant called Coble. And was that at or around Joey's funeral, or was that at a different time? Um, I I remember meeting her at the Coble restaurant, and I don't remember the time frame. And was Coble uh, a restaurant in downtown Westerville? Yes. And Emily liked to go there. Yes. She liked to go to Old Bag of Nails. That was another place she liked to go. Yes. And Jimmy B's. Yes. And those were all downtown Westerville. Yes. Sue Cavanaugh. How many times did you meet Sue Cavanaugh? Several times. Uh, several. You tell me. Uh, more than five. Less than five. Um. Probably more than five. Uh, between seventeen and uh, two thousand twenty. Yes. I want to go back to something you said, just briefly, is I want to make sure I got the words right. Friend checks. Do you remember the questions about that? Sam? Yes. And, and uh, Ms. Schickel asked you about friend checks, if you were doing those um, because of COVID. Do you remember being asked that question? Yes. But you started the friend checks with Emily after Joey killed himself, right? Um, at some point in time, she started them, yes. And um, you know that Emily was going to counseling because she was struggling with uh, Joey's suicide? No, she was required by the state of Ohio um, to take FMLA. And, and because of the requirement by the state of Ohio, is it your belief that she went to therapy? Yes. And I know that you, you testified too on your direct that she was concerned about Matt, that Matt would, that Matt would kill himself. Yes. And um, that makes sense because Matt had just lost his son. Yes. To suicide. Yes. And they were close. Yes. And you saw that when you saw Joey and Emily and Matt living together. They were a family. Right. And Emily also took Joey's suicide. Very tough. Yes. Nothing further. Reader. you about in 2017, 18, 19, and 20, uh, if you ever thought Emily was in danger or a victim of violence, you would have said something. Do you recall that line of questioning? I do. That in danger question, if you would have thought Emily was a danger to herself, would you have spoken up? Yes. Did you? Did you she, have that belief? She was very happy. Now, defense counsel was talking to you about the therapy that Emily went to. If you know, uh, did Matt seek any therapy or counseling uh, during that time after Joey's death? As far as I know, he went once. I don't know if he continued. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. Just briefly, thank you. We were just asking questions about whether or not you would report if Emily was suicidal. Right. But you testified that Emily believed that Matt was suicidal. Do you have information that Emily reported that to the police? She didn't report it to the police as far as I know. Nothing further. All right. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Take your time, no hurry. I say go slow so it's legible. That's I guess that's where I'm coming from. <laughs>
Pam, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you. Uh, the first question is, when did you get the birthday return text from Emily, and was it usual to get emojis as a form of text response from Emily? Um, the response was around 6.20, 6.27 p.m. on uh, her birthday, May 20, 24th. It wasn't unusual, but she usually gave more information um, and I texted her back, and I never got a return text. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next questions. <clears throat> when uh, you and Emily went to the pool and foraging, as you testified, what type of shoes uh, did you wear on that walk, if you recall? Um, I had on um, flip flip-flops, not flip-flops, but fit-flops. Um, they're like comfortable, elevated shoes made out of leather. Okay, thank you. And on that same walk, do you know what type of shoes Emily was wearing? She had tennis shoes on. Tennis shoes? And <clears throat> kind of switch gears here a little bit. Uh, when you got together on May 22nd, uh, with Emily, uh, did Matt drink alcohol during that get-together? Um, I don't remember if he was drinking alcohol or not. He just okay. sim simply went into the room and said hi. And the final question uh, is, uh, did you ever walk into the woods or only walk the perimeter? We only walked the perimeter. Okay. Thank you. Does that raise any questions for the state? No, Your Honor. Any questions for the defense? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Those tennis shoes uh, that you, the judge just asked you about, uh, those were Asics? I don't remember the brand. Nothing further. Thank you. All right. You may sit down. Thank you very much. All right, I think uh, in light of uh, the length of additional witnesses, this may be a good time for us to conclude for the evening. So we will take our evening recess. Uh, let's do the same uh, drill that we did this morning, go to the third floor. We we'll try to be there around 8.30. As soon as everybody's together, we'll, we'll get started. Obviously, as always, remember the court's admonition. And again, uh, enjoy yourself this evening. Most importantly, don't think about this case. Obviously, you're not going to be talking about it, but don't even be thinking about it. Relax, have a good dinner, enjoy yourself this evening, uh, get a good night's rest, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Anything anyone like to place on the record or bring to the court's attention? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. I'll be sure to give the exhibits to the court reporter. Right, let's continue to make sure that Becky uh, gets her hands on all of our exhibits on a regular basis. Thank you, Judge. All right. Um, okay. We'll see you tomorrow. As soon as you get in, uh, let's shoot for 830. As soon as everybody's in, we'll, we'll get started. Thank you. I believe we told our first witness to be here at 9, Your Honor. Okay. Um, You can't call them and get them in any earlier? Yeah, we can try. Okay, sure. all right. Well, if, if you make the effort, that'd be great. No guarantees we start before 9, but if we can, we'll try. All right, thank you.